This episode of Kind of Funny Games Cast is brought to you by Movement Watches. Movement Watches was founded on the belief that style shouldn't break the bank. We're talking classic designs, quality construction, and styled minimalism. Perfect for any occasion. Movement figured out that by selling online, they were able to cut out the middleman and retail markup, providing the best possible price. Greg has his, and now he has a sexy ass wrist, and he's never late. Get 50% off today with free shipping and free returns by going to movementwatches.com. That's mvmtwatches.com slash kinda. Movementwatches.com slash kinda. Join the movement. Did you like that one, Kev? Yeah, I really like the sexy ass wrist. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome to the first ever episode 115 of the Kind of Funny Games cast. As always, I'm Tim Geddes, joined by one of the coolest dudes in video games, Greg Miller. Hi. And joining us on this illustrious show for the first time, the dark night of news, Andrew Goldfarb. Hello. Oh, Yay. Feels good to hear you. Yay. I say it all the time on the morning show. I've started calling Dornbush when we read his stories the boy wonder of news, which is amazing. <laughs> That's, That's yeah. about right. Yeah, 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 yeah. He really, it's like scary sometimes. I'm like, oh God, you really are like five years ago, me. Yeah. I don't like it. Uh, does that end well? No, I mean, probably not. I don't know. <laughs> Although, like, since he's gotten here, he's gotten, like, super buff and stuff. So, like, so he's, he's, like, already doing what you did. It just took you he's five like years, but he's yeah. fast-forwarding it. Yeah. He didn't have to be bored in Texas for a year to go. I was going to say, yeah. when does he go do his <laughs> gearbox stretch? <laughs> yeah, Because you did get super buff. I'm proud of you. Oof. You I went did, away and you came back, went, and I was yeah. like, I'm thinking about you. But then sexually. I got, like, real small again. Real it's because I have friends here. I have like stuff to do here, so I'm not mm. like I'm not doing like the prison workout where I just have like nothing to do but like push ups and running and they stuff. Just, yeah, you just yeah. cut to you and the thing. You're just like in front of a persona poster <laughs> doing pull ups. Yeah, just like, basically. <laughs> oh my god! If you didn't know, this is the kind of funny games cast. Each and every week, we get together, talk about video games and all the things we love about them. You can get it early on Patreon.com/slash Kind of Funny Games, or you can get it late on youtube.com slash kind of funny games either way we appreciate you but if you do it on patreon we appreciate you even more like salem ghanam all ghanam did shout out to you our patreon producer for the millennium i think i'm not sure how i just works. don't understand when it became highlander mm -hmm. where steven insler you murdered all the other people and then he got murdered and, and, and salem now took over salem. and salem's there he's out there is yeah. it a monthly is it you sponsor the episode for the month or you sponsor yeah. the month but whenever people do it there's been a trend where they just keep they doing just it. They're on. here forever. Yeah, like Steven Insler had it forever. And yeah. now Salem got him all got him. Was there a conversation somewhere where that baton know. was passed? Maybe there was like a trade-off. Yeah. You know? I'm, either way, I'm into it. I mean, it. we're proud of you guys. Yeah, don't get thank me wrong. You. It's it is. Like, it's very it's weird. It allows like, us to have cute young boys like Andrew Goldfarb yes, make, his, make his games cast. Yeah. They flew me in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That, that <laughs> private helicopter. So, Goldfarb, we yeah. have you here, which mm -hmm. means we're obviously going to talk about one thing. Dogs. Yeah. No, no. Persona, five. Persona, Persona 5. Dogs. So Persona 5 is now officially out in, in the Americas. Yeah. Yep. And Europe. And everywhere. And Europe and everywhere. Great. It's been out in Japan forever, it's it seems seven like. Seven months, which feels insane. So this is our, our first proper time talking about Persona. You played sure. it a little bit the last couple weeks. Yeah, for the last uh, games cast we had, or two games cast ago, we had impressions piece up. Yeah, of like whatever it was, uh, 10 hours, five hours, something like that. Yeah, I'm what, 15 or 17 in now. Okay. Yeah. So percentage wise, what does that mean? Nothing. That's jack okay. shit. That's okay. fucking yeah. terrible. Yeah. So I've, I've done one palace. I finished off one palace, which is the, you know, the main dungeons, uh, and it got introduced to mementos, which is like the ever changing, the old school dungeons, which we'll talk about it's a like second. like the grinding dungeons. Yeah. Basically. But it's yeah. totally like that thing of like, well, we're searching for the next guy we got to take down. Whose heart are we stealing next? I'm like yep. trying to figure it all out or whatever. Go for it. How, how far are you? Uh, so I've played it five and a half times, I guess. The uh, game. Across two languages, yeah. Uh, I have it platinumed in English and Japanese. Uh, so I started in Japanese when it came out in September, and I, I was like, I'm going to play a little bit and get used to the combat, and I just beat it. Uh, how hard was that? Because you don't speak Japanese, and there's no English so option. So hard, yeah. There's, I mean... Thankfully, a lot of the menus are in English, so I kind of yeah. knew what I was doing. I knew what I was doing as far as what I was selecting parent category-wise in the menus. Okay. And then I knew how to save. And then for, like, recovery items, uh, HP and SP are written Obviously. in English. Yeah, so, yeah, like, yeah. that stuff, I, I was pretty good on that. Um, it was harder. Like, I was terrified to get a status ailment because I didn't know. Like, <laughs> which I one I have? <laughs> I don't know which item heals that. I was terrified yeah. to die because I didn't know which of my items. I would, like, trial and error, like, all my healing spells and be like... All right, I'm going to bring this guy. No, that just to heal nope. somebody else. Yeah, that yeah, wasn't yeah, great. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was a lot of that. Uh, the harder part. Were you taking copious notes? To impossibly complicated notes. I was to the point where if I found an item I needed, I would 
take a picture with my phone and then like essentially like copy the Japanese characters by hand. And then I had like a Photoshop doc that was like, this one equals revive, this one equals whatever. Yeah, it was a little weird. So what, what, what about the story? Does it have English subtitles in it? Uh, not in the Japanese version, no. Wow. They might have added it now. But that was my thing. Like, So my playtime's all weird because I skipped cutscenes when I was playing in Japanese. Mm. But also things that should have taken me one minute took me an hour. Because it's like, go to the faculty office in the third floor. I don't know what's telling me that. So I, I talked to every <laughs> single person and tried every single door to figure out what it wanted. And uh, yeah, it took a while. This is endlessly <laughs> Impressive to me. Like when I was in third is that the grade, word? it is, it is, it is. Uh, the, the most impressive thing I've ever done in my life is I beat Pokemon Silver when I, I had it imported when I was in third grade and it was Japanese and I beat the game. Ooh. At this point, I don't know how I did that. I could barely read English in third grade. <laughs> I don't know how the hell I did that, but it was the same thing of just kind of figuring out, all right, well, this squiggly line throws the Pokeball so I can right. figure that out. But Pokemon doesn't really have a story. So it's kind of like over a while you kind of figure out the status ailments, how they look. So I'm like, all right, I know what's going on here. I just don't understand how you could play a game that like where the story like actually matters. <laughs> it's weird because I, it, I kind of understood. I, I keep relating it to like when, when you're at a bar or a restaurant and a movie's on on mute. Sure. And you can look up at it and like if someone gets shot in the head, you understand that that guy got shot in the head, but you're not going to know why. Or like a, a good example is Bioshock. If you were to play Bioshock, not understanding. You would spoilers for Bioshock, sorry. Uh, you I would, was just about to play it. <laughs> you would know when Andrew Ryan gets clubbed to death, but you're not going to understand would you kindly, and you're not sure. going to get like the context of the moment. So that was that was it for me. Like I knew broad strokes, but I didn't have a lot of context. Yeah. And then so I was kind of like preserving it in that way, where like in English I still like was learning as it was going because I was like, oh, like that's why he hates that guy. How many like, times playing the English version were you like, man, I'm, I was so stupid to do it the other like way. Like 50 at yeah, least. Yeah, yeah. There were so many moments where I was like, oh, like that's why I'm fighting this dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So weird. So my question comes down to on this is that you get American English version. Mm. You go through and platinum this. How long does that take? Well, that was weird because I, like puzzle solutions I basically remembered and mm. I had a lot of like notes written down so like a lot of that stuff worked um, I would say around 110 hours damn um, it, it, which is like surprisingly fast to get that because the story itself probably takes 80 to 100 if you you know do everything talk to people yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I would say like 110 120 it's, it, it's a little hard because the the way I do it and I have some like trophy tips I can give or whatever but like hot tips if you have uh, tip, if you keep a save on November 25th that's the longest stretch of free time you'll get in the game um, and so I, even after I beat the game, I then would reload that save and just morning, noon, and night, just read books for two weeks mm, to get that trophy mm, or mm. like morning, noon, and night, play games to get that trophy or go fishing to get that trophy. So like I kept reloading the same save for that stuff. Gotcha. Um, so like my play count, my play timer, like isn't exactly accurate. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So do you like this game? No, it's really bad. <laughs> 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 what if I did play it in English? I'm like, oh no. Oh my God. <laughs> this so, is horrible. So the question for me as somebody that's never played a persona game at all. Two questions. One, mm -hmm. is this a good jumping in point? And two, how does this compare to the other ones? Uh, I think it's absolutely a good jumping in point because uh, there's no, there's like some Easter egg relations and some things that sort of carry over, but it's like like a Final Fantasy, like new story, new characters, all that stuff. So totally good place to jump in. Um, systems wise, like battle wise, it, it is by far the best. In the same way that um, if you play, because I started actually my first Persona game that I like really played through was Persona 4 Golden, um, like while you were reviewing yeah. it. I've, I've been talking to people about why for me this is such a special games cast to have you on is that it's totally the role reversal in a way yeah. of like, I when I reviewed Golden for IGN or whatever, I remember when you picked it up and then you got obsessed with it. And so here we are and it's like, the, it's the, you're still obsessed with it, but you reviewed it and you know everything about this and I'm still so young in the game and every, all, everything's, I'm like, and more, the cat turns into a car? Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like so excited about all this crazy shit that's happening. It's funny because you know how like a, I'm sure you guys have this too there's always like someone who recommends a thing to you and they're like you would love this and you're like yeah I'll get around to it like and you don't actually do it yeah that's been that was me with Persona for a long time and I tried to play uh, when I was big into PSP I tried to play Persona 3 Portable Fez. just like mm. didn't like I, I was interested in it but like totally never dived in and then yeah when um when we got golden, yeah. uh, God did I it just hit the perfect like every note for me and I I got like really into it. And then I tried to go back to Persona 3 Portable after, and it definitely, you you felt like that it was like aged a little yeah, bit. Yeah, of course, like of that. course. Like I love the, I actually like the characters probably better in Persona 3, and I like the story a lot, but for sure, like the systems feel a little worse than in Golden. Um, so as far as jumping on point, like 
five totally makes golden feel that way now. Like, yeah. uh, for the review, I went back and played a little of P4, and I was like, oh, no. Like, I love this game. <laughs> I love replaying it, but it's, like, so hard to go back to now. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, I mean, for me, you know, jumping into Persona 5, it is that thing, of it, and I know what you're saying, because I've gone back since and looked at videos of Persona 4 Golden, but it is of, like, oh, yeah, this is Persona. This is what I remember Persona 4 doing. You go back, like, oh, no, this is not yeah. what Persona 4 looked like or felt like. or It is those systems, but it is the fact that I was telling uh, Kevin, I think, earlier today or somebody else maybe nick about the fact that as far as i loved it (laughs) as far as a jumping in point though the fact that i feel like persona 5 even though i've played uh, what i've so i started with three then reviewed uh portable then reviewed golden the fact that uh the systems are being explained even better here where i feel like i'm jumping in and this is why i recommend it as a jumping in point of like you get into this and it's it's not just like oh you should know how to do this it is very much like this is and they're saying it in a way that i'm always i was like oh right like i never thought about it that way i never used it that way yeah, it's really tutorial heavy, uh, but in a good way because I feel like it would be totally overwhelming if it wasn't. Right. Like it kind of needs to be handholdy. And it, it's also like when I was playing through it, um, especially after having played in Japanese, like some of the tutorials, I was like, oh God, I wish I could skip these. But then, you know, there is stuff like even if you played Persona 3 and 4 front to back and you're obsessed with them and have done everything, like there's still stuff like ranged weapons and negotiation yeah. that yeah. are actually going back to like Persona 2 and that I, And that's like, the thing is for me starting with 3, I never knew about those. And so to have that in there, I'm like, what a cool th- when I read your review and I went back and oh, I'm like, oh, I didn't realize this is a callback to the series before I even got there because I feel yeah. like I've been there so long. I was reviewing the stuff on PS2 IGN team. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's crazy. It, it's weird because yeah, like it, I, I always feel like I feel like because I really wear it on my sleeve and I like, I'm literally wearing a persona <laughs> shirt. Like I I love the series and it like means a lot to me. But I'm totally like a late like even yeah. like a bandwagon fan because I jumped in at Golden. Sure. And so like I've gone back and played. Um, I haven't beaten Persona One. Uh, I've only played one of the Persona Twos. Like I, I I'm not as well versed as I should be on like the old school stuff. But I do really appreciate watching the series evolve for sure because it's like it's really cool going back and looking at that history of. You know, like, I don't think people think of Persona the way they think of, like, Crash or Tomb Raider or Mario or Zelda or anything, but it's been around for 20 years. Yeah. So it really does have, like, like there's a, a Shin Megami Tensei Universe um, Virtual Boy game, and it's, like, so insane that it's been around really? for that long. Yeah. Yeah, Jack Brothers is on Virtual Boy, which is, like, so weird to think about. And, like, Persona 1 is a PS1 game. Like, it just it's crazy that it has that legacy. So I think in that way, like, this does feel like the culmination of like everything it's been building to sure but it's also for me the the improvements they've made to it where it is like okay i haven't played before in a while but the platforming around chandeliers or the camera yep. angles or the way the story is told in flashbacks like they're doing so many interesting cinematic touches that are really like i think you know persona 4 gold and nailed so much in terms of like all right here's characters you care about and this really is the presentation of all the information yeah i think that's where it's like the easiest way to explain why it's better is that um the dungeons in Persona 4 are visually themed, but they're still essentially the same thing. They're yeah. randomly generated hallways, and you're working your way up and up and up, and maybe there's a room with some treasure or an enemy, but you're basically doing the same thing. These aren't that. These are hand-built, like, defined dungeons. Yeah. They all have different puzzle types that, like, literally feel like different games. Like, it's it's completely different. Um, and then if you want the grinding, if you want that, like, randomly generated, that's Mementos, which yeah. you were talking about. So, well, And that's such a nice throwback to it because yeah. that is the thing of when I was going, I, you know, I've so I've polished off one palace. I've gotten into Mementos. I haven't even started the second uh, palace yet, which is the dungeon. And being in that first one, it was like, oh, man, how, this is so different. And, it, and it, first it was that thing of, like, what what is different about it? And I was like, oh, right, like, Persona 4, the way they randomly generate, even Persona 3, right, it was like, that's fine, but it got so monotonous. Because yeah. once I got in and I was like, oh my God, like, Rize's world's a strip club. Well, that's yeah. cool. But then it was just like, all right, well, it's just it's another just fucking pink neon pink of, hallway yeah. that I'm going through. Here it is, like, there's the dungeons on the, you know, then there's the nice things, the chandeliers, the secret passages. How do you get through this wall? Yeah. The book puzzle. Yeah, it's really crazy. And, and even, especially as you get further, like, they get more complicated. They get more, uh, they get bigger. Like, the scale of them gets so much bigger. I don't know. I, I'm just so impressed with, like, the scope of this game and how much it has because everything we're talking about right now is battle and like dungeons and all of that. And that's half the game. That's not even counting how big Tokyo is and how like, how distinct like Shibuya and Shinjuku and Akihabara feel and, and like just how accurate it feels to Japan. Like it's just such a incredible, like improvement upon everything. Like what I keep saying is um, (laughs) 
last year and, and this year, you look at like Zelda or Final Fantasy and their big thing is breaking conventions, right? Like Zelda rethought everything and Final Fantasy like totally took away turn-based combat and made it much more action-oriented and made it kind of Western influenced. And like, that is awesome. And that really helped those games. And I think like in a lot of ways it made them more approachable and things like that. Persona take the, takes the exact opposite approach. It is leaning so hard into a genre and leaning so hard into kind of like what it's built in the previous versions that like for me it is easily the best turn-based rpg of 10 20 years like going back to that like snes era because like it's impossible to compare to chrono trigger or final fantasy 6 or the things that are like revolutionary yeah, yeah. but i don't know that anything has felt turn-based wise this good since hmm. at least like ps2 era like it, like it's been a while since something feels this like genre defining in that way right and that and that's the thing of like what you're talking about i think when you know for me with Persona, it is, oh my God, what's the next dungeon going to look like? And who's this next character? And in Memento, I was like, you know, well, who am I going after or whatever? But like, it's the old Persona trope of like, all right, you're back in your room. Yeah. And it's like, oh, cool. Can I, I can't leave. Yeah. Like, why didn't you just put me to bed? Why, yeah. why do you make me go to bed? You just, you know what I mean? But then it's yep. like, no, no, the cat's like stopped me from going out. I'm like, what the fuck? Why I am I even about to do this? I'll, I'll, then I'll make lock picks. No, no, you can't. You're tired. Go to bed. I'm like, just put me to bed. So I, and I think that's like, without like getting too specific, like that is where this game gets even cooler because the confidants, which are what social links are called, can even change some of that. Like mm. they can give you extra free time. They can give you, they now much more than just like you're spending time with this person and you can date them. And like, if it's a party member, they get like an extra attack in battle or whatever. They are now like game changers in a way that like they can actually affect the way you spend time in the real world or they can it like affect battle. And they're like much smarter about like uh, making them connected to what the person does so like there's like this like watched a politician dude and like he gives speeches and so he helps your negotiation and things like that and there's like um i, I don't know i don't want to get into too many like specific examples but yeah like they are just so smart about it everything just feels so much more like well thought through how's the story though so when it comes to rpgs specifically jrpgs i think the story is kind of my my favorite part at the end of the day like yeah. gameplay is always fun but it's always the means to an end of getting to the next cutscene and all that like how do you think it holds up I, so to me, and why I say in my review, I do think it's the best one. Um, and I, I will be curious to see what people think. I, I think the overall story is so much more like cohesive and it feels like it matters more to me. Um, and you mentioned like the, so like the way the game starts, it just throws you in. And then it's kind of told in flashbacks leading up to that point. Um, I like to call it the Maverick because there's an old Mel Gibson movie called Maverick that does it. And when I was a kid, that was the first time I saw a movie do that. It wasn't the first, but they Maverick it. To you, move. to you. That's where it all started. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like they're, they're working their way back up. And uh, that to me, give, like it makes you a little more invested because it makes you like, you feel like you're putting the pieces together and it has that almost like um, usual suspect style vibe yeah. where hmm. you're like waiting for like the missing Reveals, puzzle pieces yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And that was the thing of getting ready for this sec, you know, my second dungeon, my second heart to steal where in the flashback, she turns the paper and she's like, and how yeah. did this guy come into play? Yes. I'm like, ah, I, I, I don't know. I can't wait to find out. Let's go play the game. <laughs> and it gives you that cool thing where like, you feel like you're like, you have a one up over the characters because they're like, who's our next target going to be? And you're like, yeah, oh, yeah, it's yeah. that weird dude yeah, yeah, I yeah, just yeah. saw. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think they're, um, they're really smart about that. I it, like, it is really long. And so I do think it gets into like some pacing stuff towards the end, uh, but like it's all minor. I don't know. I I don't think, I don't think uh, Persona three or four stories quite had like the weight that this one had at least at least for me. Well, that's what I thought was really interesting about starting it right and going into and I fuck I you know how bad I am with names Kamashita's dungeon mm -hmm. right okay cool Crushed in it. in the thank you so much in the fact that like when you start when this they start peeling back like what he's doing and like you're like. F this is fucked up, and then yeah. I, and I was and I remember I, I you know I wasn't obviously ready to do any kind of review for it, but I put out a tweet at the embargo. It's just like hey, I'm super early, but like I'm really into how like adult this story is. And then it was like, well, I guess like Persona Four it was you know a guy hung himself, and like this and I'm like well, but it wasn't the same way where it was yeah. also very much like well, all right, whatever, you know what I mean. And this is the the opposite of like this shit's fucked up and people yep. are in really shitty situations and you're a dirt baggy kind of kid you're fucking you don't have do dojima to fall back on this one dojima or whatever like it's like you're the guy taking care of you at the coffee shop sucks i hate him I, he gets better i'm sure he does well i mean he's already trying to do that shit and i'm like i'm not gonna forget <laughs> i'm not gonna forget what an asshole you've been how's the dating and all that stuff uh it's good i i feel like um it i think there's like more variation in the people like like that you can you can date every woman in the game basically at every social link um i do find it weird it feels outdated to me that you can't date any of the men i, I do think that's weird like i've talked about that and beyond it just it, it feels like a weird omission to me uh to i to not at least if they, if they don't want to do same-sex dating they could have gone the persona 3 portable like give me a female protagonist yep. option or give you the option to date more people but it just feels really weird how blatant it is when you like level up a 
female protagonist or a female confidant and it's like hey is, are you gonna be romantic or platonic and then you do the man and it just ends and it's just like a really weird it, it i i felt that gap i think mm, interesting. but i do think like the actual like relationships themselves are more interesting and more varied and feel less obvious mm. um than i think they did in in p4 well it's just the same thing too like every one of the, so far every one of the confidence i have like I'm way more interested in their story, in their backstory before I got there where yeah. Chie was just like, I'm good at sports and I love meat. And I'm like, I love you, Chie, don't get me wrong. But like, we're just kids. Whereas this does feel like there's like a real high school drama kind of thing happening yep. there. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like a range of uh, ages and uh, genders and circumstances that I think help a lot that like, it doesn't just feel like you're like this guy in a school uniform or this girl in a school uniform yeah. or this guy works a part-time job. It's like much more varied than that. And it's people that have like kind of <laughs> it, like, and plus like the way the ones you unlock are tied to the areas of Tokyo you can visit. So like they have much more like distinct circumstances. Like when you're in Shinjuku, it gets a little seedier and there's like a bar available. So like there's like someone who's like a drunk journalist that you can have a confidant with. That's very different than someone you would meet at like a, you know, convenience store standing sure. in, the, in whatever in the square of the subway. It's really good. It's a great game. I'd be I'd be genuinely curious to see. What see, you're my, my thing is so much about this is intriguing to me. Love anime, love the over the topness, love the art style, love the idea of the dating and all that, and like all the the more adult themes and all. It, it all sounds great. It just man, hundred hours. Yeah, I'm like, and I just I when it comes to story based things, like I would be in this for the characters and story. That just sounds like a bit too much. Yeah, I mean, especially now. Like, I mean, we're we're in this weird boat where like. Games get delayed so often and it happens and happens, but now we're like living through all that Q4 stuff that got delayed to Q1 mm -hmm. and it's like, oh no, it's Zelda and it's Horizon, Horizon and it's it's this and it's near and it's mm -hmm. all these games that are like really, really, really good and interesting but require a major time investment. And then that's not even to mention like Night in the Woods or yep. like yeah. these smaller games of ukulele that mm -hmm. seem great. Snake Pass. Snake Pass. Snake yeah, Pass. like yeah. there's so many things I would love to put 10 or 15 hours into, but I, you know, like... The fact that I haven't played a new Mass Effect game mm -hmm. blows my mind. Like, I love that series so much. And, like, I, like, there's a PS4 exclusive that everybody universally loves that I have barely touched because of Zelda. Like, mm -hmm. I haven't touched Horizon. That blows my mind. Yeah, right. Persona to me, I think, is a, a perfect example of the type of game that I know that I don't really want to give a chance because I keep trying to find excuses of why I'm not going to play it, whether it's saying it's too long or now I'm like, oh, well, if this was portable, I feel like I have a better chance to play yeah. it. I'm like, that's bullshit. I didn't play Persona 4. <laughs> yeah. And, like, that was And portable. that was portable, but yeah. It, but it's just interesting that, so this is out on PS3 and PS4, and it is coming at a time, especially in America now, where there's so many of these games coming out. So I'm interested to see how it does, but I also don't ex think that Atlas is expecting it to like, you know, blow the fucking doors down in I terms mean, of sales. I think the reviews are so good, and I'm sure everyone will be playing it on Twitch, so so many people will, <laughs> will see these live streams. And well, like, so talking about, talk about the Twitch thing, like, do you do you really think that that's gonna affect them that negatively? And also, don't you think that they'll change it? Because I, I think that it's been out in Japan. They haven't changed in Japan, but I feel like to bring up to everyone up to Japanese speed, Twitch audience to bring everyone up to yeah. speed. We're recording this on Wednesday. On Tuesday, the game came out, and the Atlas put out a statement that was basically like, "Hey, if you, we obviously have disabled streaming and screenshots in the game, which is so fucking stupid, it's insane." And then it affects my whole brand on Twitter. I know, right? I know. I'm like, I'm like, do I want to take photos of the screen? Tweet these, yeah. huh? and then they were like, "Hey, if you're gonna stream it, please don't." And this is to everyone, not the press. If yeah. you're gonna, if you're gonna stream this, please don't stream after in the game uh, July seventh. When that, or so there'll be problems. Wink. That like, was what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The more insane thing is that the, the post they put up is literally copy pasted from our press embargo. So it's literally like example of how to talk about the game, good and bad. And I'm like, you can't say that to people who the bought the game. Your like, customers. Yeah. It's crazy that they're like, they just don't, it, this isn't enforceable to me. Yeah. Uh, like even, even the Twitch streams and everything, like I don't understand the amount of manpower it would take to look through every single person who puts up a 91 minute let's play or who streams past a certain date that's impossible to recognize without watching each video. Like I just, I don't understand how they could possibly enforce it. It's also not to mention the fact that I think in a, there's not a large section of the audience, but there is a section of the audience who's bought this game, who's going to stream it or put up let's plays who they're not following IGN or Polygon or anybody. They have no idea you said this. Yeah. And this totally. isn't in your game. This isn't in your like terms yeah, of service when up. I say okay. Yeah. And and I mean, as far as your question of if it'll hurt it, in the long run, probably not that much. But I do, like I've seen people on Twitter talking about, um, like Amanda Cosmos, who I follow, pointed out that there's a lot of people who are artists who, while they're painting or drawing, they watch Twitch streams. And then they do fan art related to a mm. game. And then they put out that fan art and it gets 100,000 retweets. And like, yeah, that's probably a pretty small actual connection to sales. But in terms of like 
awareness. The cultural it's the best type of marketing there is. Is people yeah. that actually like the shit. And think about like Overwatch or something, for example. Like it's it's all of the people who are drawing fan art and talking about the game and buying all the merchandise and all of that stuff. Like that is a small part of the machine. And Blizzard is so much bigger than like an Atlas game and, and a kind of niche JRPG. But I feel like they're preventing themselves from taking even baby steps towards that status by mm-hmm. not allowing people to just stumble upon the game on Twitter. What I was talking about today is just the fact that I can't believe they're fucking up their goodwill like this. Yes. Is that Atlas has been a, a great friend to gamers. You know what I mean? And Atlas is the company that I think this game is going to do incredibly well. You know, what I mean? and, I, and I think I, what I've said before is that for me, it's the Uncharted Uncharted 2 thing where Uncharted came out and if you had a PS3, you played it and loved it. I mean, you, people talked about it for years. So when Uncharted 2 came out, you if you had by then people had PS3s and they're like, oh, I'll pick that up and I never played Uncharted 1. Yep. They understood. Persona 4 you haven't not been able to hear about that game everywhere. Yeah. I mean, anytime Vita comes up, it's the best Vita game. Everybody knows that. So like Persona 5 coming out to the most popular console, yep. like, okay, yeah, of course I'll give that a shot. But then yep. to come out and say and like start hiding it and totally be tone deaf to what 2017 is to be a game's publisher. I mean, I think there are people, like we were just talking about how busy it is with Horizon and Zelda and all this stuff. And like there is a segment of people, like maybe it's not millions, but there are people who like number one, like you guys rely on playing these games as their job or number two who like to go home and unwind by streaming and by playing a game for their Twitch channels and they will probably pick a different game now. Yeah. Like they might have bought Persona and now maybe they will just be like, you know what, maybe I will jump into Horizon or Mass Effect or whatever it is. So I don't know, like again, like I don't know that that's really going to make that much of a dent, but I, I do, I agree. It hurts their goodwill and I think it hurts their kind of like that discoverability of of people finding this game who might not have otherwise. And, that, and you know what sucks about not being able to take screenshots or share videos easily and all this stuff is the game's beautiful. Like yeah. that's the mm-hmm. big takeaway for me is like I love the framing. I love finishing a battle and that ding, 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 and like you walking yeah. and all the stuff comes and it's so stylized. And all the transitions, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really weird. It's also I I feel like um, even having played the game many many times, uh, <laughs> the cutoff point feels really arbitrary to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't understand. I just I don't. That post was like completely it, it wasn't out of left field like i shouldn't be surprised by it because i i understand that like um they're playing a little bit old school and that they're very concerned about spoilers sure. and all of that but it, it does just feel like it's like so aggressive and like i hate using terms like anti-consumer like that's that's a little too intense i think but it 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 isn't great for the people who bought your game, especially to do it after it's out, after yeah. pre-orders have shipped. Like it just, mm. it, and it just wasn't great. It's just that thing too, though. I mean, like the game's been out in Japan. Like you could yeah. watch the ending for already. Seven See, like, months. I'm not. Yeah. Go on YouTube, search for Persona Five playthrough. Literally, you can watch a full playthrough of that game right now. Yeah, and that and the whole part, you know, like the thing about <sighs> Persona and playing Persona is making those relationships and choosing who you want to invest time with and how do you want to expand your character and how do you want to fuse your personas and do all these different things. It's not about. Well, in the end, who was the real bad (laughs) guy? You know what I mean? Like, that was never, that's not what this 100-hour journey is about. So why worry so much about this stupid thing? Yeah. Yeah, and plus, like, it's that thing where, like, we all know how the internet works. That Like, the second they were like, please don't talk about spoilers, every response to that tweet is the ending of the game. It's it's all, like, like, don't go anywhere near Atlas's, like, official post right now because it's all spoilers. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) My, uh, you want to transition out, I think. But my question would be then, so how hard was the platinum in English? Not that bad. It's really I, I kids do hit me up and they're like, "This is worse than Persona Four Gold." And when the trophies popped, some of it is like the um, fusing the getting 100 percent the compendium. I think is harder this time around. Um, it so the ones that you think are going to be hard are actually not that bad. Like clearing all missions and even all social links um, are pretty straightforward. I made one stupid mistake, so I had to do it in three playthroughs. But you can do it in one and a half. Yeah. Um, but the ones that are harder are uh, there's three that require new game plus. And then there's some missable stuff. Like the best tip I can give you is to, uh, if you're trying to get read all books, I thought I was being so smart. I was buying books for the whole game and I had all my time planned out and I was like, oh, I can spend like this many days like reading during free time. It'll be great. Uh, And the trophy didn't pop. And I was like, what? And then I realized there are books in the school library that you can only get up until a certain point. So Um, like the best tip I can give you is read all of those ASAP, like get through, I think you unlock a new one every month up until November, like read those as fast as you can and and have them because then you can actually get the trophy. Gotcha. And then, and rotate saves a lot because yeah, you would put this one up that uh, your Twitter is filled. I'm like looking at it like, (laughs) like, "Mm, yeah, these are interesting at you where you're like save every other day. Yeah. My advice is that you, you know, if you're playing the game casually, a a lot of people reply to me and they're like, Oh, this is going to be my first persona game, but that just scared the hell out of me. Like, Play the game normally. It's totally fine. You don't need to be insane. But if you're trying to max out social links and max out books and max out playing games and do all the social activities, uh, I recommend there's 16 save slots plus a cloud save slot. Use all 16 and then 
save every other in-game day because that means if you really need to at any given point you can go back roughly 30 days which means basically you can go back to the previous dungeon so if you miss something or if you want to do something differently uh it just gives you the option of going back which you probably won't need but like for example if i had known about not being able to get into the library after a certain point i i would have been smarter and sure you know play differently and then when you got you did you figure all this out on your own or did you have to like the english platinum yeah yeah i mean so the the trophies are the same because right now by the way you're the only person with this platinum or the first person with this platinum right that's right yeah that's I, I, awesome i want to see if anyone just hasn't synced yet because i can't imagine them there i guarantee you that you're the first person only person there's some of the like the platinum didn't surprise me that much but there are some trophies where i'm like how am i the only person who like did this thing towards the end of the game that like isn't even that hard to do. Yeah, like, yeah. There's like, there's a lot that I'm very surprised if I really am the only one. Um, yeah, I, I figured them out, but they're the things that you would expect. Like yeah. the Japanese trophy list for all lives. So I used Google translate and I understood basically what was happening. Yeah. And like stuff like 250 navigation lines was a persona four thing. Yeah. Um, which sucked. Is it better here? Uh, it is a little better. Although I don't know if that's just because I knew to expect <laughs> it. So I was just analyzing nonstop from sure. the minute I got the navigator. Um, yeah, there's like things like that that are like it was very obvious there's going to be get every persona, complete every mission, yeah, yeah. get every social link. That stuff's clear. Um, there's some that are harder. There's like some new game plus stuff that you you have to do like certain things, and then you can only get the complete the compendium one in new game plus. So okay. like that that one's hard to do because there are these. Remember the gold hands in Persona yep. Four, like the treasure. I fucking monsters? hated those things. So like, there's an equivalent of that in this, and there's eight of them, and they only spawn in either certain palaces or certain floors of mementos. And that took me forever. Yeah. Um, and the reason I went back and got the Japanese one was because I had like, I think 65 or 70% of the trophies. And I was like, if I don't do this right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will never know the game well enough again to do it. Sure. So, that's a good point. So I went back and got that. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I went like, across everything, I, I'm like at roughly 220, 230 hours Jesus this game, probably. Christ. Jesus. The final question about Persona here is from LP Fanatic Forever. Mm. What's one piece of advice you'd give someone starting Persona 5 as their first Persona? Uh, not to get overwhelmed by the calendar thing. I think everybody, the first time they play one of these games, sees like, oh, you have to beat the dungeon by a certain time or you're screwed and then you get a game over. And it feels very overwhelming. Like, literally the loading screen in the bottom right says take your time every time you do anything. Like, it is okay to, to take your time. It is like, you will be fine if you pace yourself. Uh, the way dungeons work this time around is there are these safe rooms. And anytime, once you get partway through a dungeon, you can save, and there's like maybe five to 10 of those per dungeon. Once you hit a safe room, not only can you save your game and leave and everything, but you can also fast travel to that safe room and between that safe room and other safe rooms. Mm. So if you get, you know, play through a dungeon for three, four hours, get to maybe the third, fourth safe room, then leave, go back, recover, take some casual time to like do some social links or do like activities and then come back. But like the people who are who try and finish these dungeons in one go, I think are gonna get burned out so fast and just like especially on harder difficulties, you'll just be banging your head against a wall. So yeah. that that would be my advice is just like don't get overwhelmed by the calendar system. Like it's actually really cool and, and fun. Also, like you will never re- like you 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 won't lose those days. So if you do complete a dungeon in one day, you still get the ten days of free time or whatever after that. And that's why you can let it go longer too. Exactly. That's always what I try to do is if yeah. I when I'm like, oh, they're and I mean previous personas and now this one with off the one main dungeon of just being like okay cool that's where it is how many days do i have like three days left and i'll fuck yeah. around I'm yeah, because exactly. otherwise it is just that weird thing of like well we did it and i that's what i did beat it early and they were just, and they're just like wow i wonder if he's gonna change his heart i guess we'll just keep waiting and find out <laughs> yeah. when, the, when the day's supposed to come like all right it always reminds me of like in mass Effect 3 and they're like the world is ending we have to be fast and then you're just like digging for war and yeah, like yeah, mining yeah, a planet yeah, yeah. for six days or like zelda's the same thing like i'm like waiting for a blood moon to unlock a shrine and, like sitting there like days and days and days are going by and I'm picturing Zelda in the castle like, like dude. oh my god dude I can see you from my window <laughs> <laughs> please come help and then my final question yes uh, who's your girl this time around who, you, got, Ooh, who you were in love with Rise back in the day uh, I don't know like I, I think Marie ended up being my favorite when all of a sudden oh, that's in, a good point in yeah. Persona 4 um, this one's hard party member wise I feel like it, well I it, can I say I, the people around the box in trailers I guess the, the one who ends up being your navigator uh, I guess I won't give away who people are is probably my favorite party member girl, but I have some weird reservations about so, story wise about oh, okay. dating her that feel really weird. Okay, okay. Uh, my favorite person in the game overall, I mentioned the drunk journalist, I think it's probably nice, okay. her, maybe mm-hmm. the doctor. Mm-hmm. You just like Marty so much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, it's just like I, I had to like channel him into the game somehow, and it yeah. doesn't let you get date dudes. It's drunk, it's like. drunk journalist, <laughs> yeah. Marty. Yeah. Marty Sleeva. There it is. Yeah. It. All right. 
Moving to something I can talk about. Ooh. Nintendo Switch. Persona and it's, 4. And it's, like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's accessories. So, you have a Switch. I do have a Switch. I have a Switch. I have a Switch. You have a Switch too. Okay, cool. Yeah. When did you get yours? How uh, are you feeling about it? Well, I pre-ordered it, but then Amazon gave it to me like three days after launch. Um, mm, shout out to Amazon. I love it. I'm a real weirdo. We were just talking about this. I love portables. Like I, I still love my Vita. I have not taken the dock out of the box yet. Like I have only played this thing in handheld mode as though it's like a, a Vita. Yeah, so Nick's the same way too. I treat it like a portable system. Um, I mean, 95% of that's how I've played it too. Kev, yeah. have you played with it attached to a TV? Wait, hold on. Kevin's going to throw a bunch of switches, turn on his microphone, make sure it's working. I have not. No, no, no. I haven't at all, actually. I yeah. just play. It's the way to be. While Paul is sleeping yeah. or yeah, in little... I, I would say that I'm, I'm maybe 60, 40. 60 really? portable, 40 on TV. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I probably have put a grand total on a TV. Well, I guess if you count... Not counting that week where I played uh, the morning yeah. leading yeah. shows, it's probably been like three hours on a TV for mm. Zelda. When you... Like, this has like been a weird out of character quiet period for travel for me since it's been out <laughs> so it's like I haven't gotten that like plane experience yet either it's so but, good got uh, it yeah. so good I can't wait no I love it but BCW, I just, I've beaten Zelda since the last games hey Ooh, there I'm, you go I'm putting it off so I have 118 shrines what yeah I have uh I'm like taking my time I'm so weird like I played it so backwards I unlocked the full map before I ever even went to Kakariko village so like I've only talked to Impa like twice and I've done I've done three divine beasts now um, and now I'm going to start going for memories. Like, I'm super taking my time. Wow. It's so it's good. It, it is. is. So it good. really is. I just had to get ready for Mario Kart 8, though. Oh, yeah. Or Mario yeah, Kart. That's it's the thing. I would like coming. to beat it before then. I mean, I yeah, you're, yeah, you're pretty close. My thing with the reason that I play so much with the TV is I like the Pro Controller so much. Yeah. That it's not really comfortable playing the Pro Controller on the little screen, especially when I have a 65 inch TV. So I'm yeah, like, that makes why sense. wouldn't I just do this? Yeah. And the Pro Controller, it's funny because, like, I, I think when more games are out for it, like, I've played at work and at events and stuff. I've played other games that are great. And like, I, I like Shovel Knight is incredible. I can't mm -hmm. recommend that game enough. And like Snake Pass seems really cool. And, and have Snipper you played uh, Shovel Knight Spectre of Torment? I haven't yet. No, it's so good. Oh my God. I'm excited. So I love Shovel Knight. I didn't realize that this second round of DLC or whatever the hell you want to call it is a new game. Yeah. Like I've just been like, I've been hearing him talk about all this stuff forever. And I, we played me and Colin did a let's play of the, uh, um, Plague Knight DLC. Mm -hmm. I forgot what that was called, but it was just like you just play as a new character. You have different abilities, but it's the same game. Well, that's Yacht Club is like this has to be the most generous. Like they are because there are some Kickstarters I backed. Like I still haven't gotten the physical stuff from my Mighty Number no. Nine <laughs> pledge. Like Jesus. in 2013. But then like and Shovel Knight <laughs> is the opposite. They yeah. have been so good, and like they could have called those Shovel Knight Two, Shovel Knight Three, and made a boatload of money. But instead, if you backed it, it's still free. Like that's yeah. crazy. Like, and now they have the new Treasure Trove or whatever. Yeah, and so Treasure like Trove has everything, for all of it, which is awesome. And uh. there's there's still more. The King Knight one's coming out later too. Yep. But playing the Plague Knight one, I didn't like it. Didn't like how he played. And I was like, I already played the game. I, yeah. I don't need to do this again. Uh, but this one for for Spectre Knight, first off, my favorite of the knights. <laughs> Second off, it's a prequel to Shovel Knight, yep. and it's uh, it reminds me of Mario Galaxy Two from One, where huh. there's no more world map. It's just you just choose the levels. And and go to it, but they're the same style of level. It's just they're totally remixed to play for Spectre Knight's play style, which is a lot more familiar to yeah. Shovel Knight. Oh man, I am blown away by how much they they put into this game that is free for people that bought this game years ago on any of the. You're making me want to play it. So it's like, yeah, it's so good. It's, it's exclusive to Switch right now, but it's gonna uh, timed exclusive. It's yeah, but it'll be on everything. Uh, yeah, that Shovel Knight came to. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm in that boat where like that is when I think I'll start playing on my TV. Is when like other stuff comes because like Zelda. I'm playing in a very specific way where I set myself a little like micro adventure every night and I give myself an arbitrary goal and do it uh, like find a shrine or whatever it is. Um, I think other games I'll want it on my TV again. Mm -hmm. um, it's also like I'm less dominated by playing Persona 4 review and, and playing stuff that like I knew I needed to get through. So now I'm like taking a breath and I'm like when I do beat Zelda, I'm actually going to like feel free to like maybe I will play. Come on, you know what I want to do now. Yeah, what yeah. year is it? Graceful Explosion Me Machine shout out by the way. Oh, you, have you been playing it? Yeah. It's, I'm still super into it. Yeah, after I didn't get it Nindy's event. I'm bummed that I missed the uh, Global Test Fire for Splatoon 2. Mm. I feel like the times weird. were so weird. That was weird. so yeah. weird. Here's yeah. the two, 55 minutes to jump in. Exactly. I'm like, what do you want me to do? Well, and then, yeah. Yeah. People seem to really like it, though, from NeoGAF yep. impressions and stuff. Totally. So I'm stoked about that. Blaster Master, I found, now that I'm done with Zelda, I, I've been going back and playing the eShop game. Sure. Don't really like Blaster Master too much. Yeah, it didn't do anything for nah, me, but that's not, not my kind of game. Um, it is my type of game, and it just it felt, it felt wrong. I'm loving Snake Pass. Uh, I do think that. That's the type of game that I don't really want to be playing right now. Um, like I feel like I'd rather um, ukulele come, yeah. so I want to give that a shot. I really want to play Snake Pass is fun, but I just feel like the levels. Uh, 
they make you they're so well designed that they make you want to get all of the the coins and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like I'm finding myself when Gio's watching TV that I'm like I, I don't want to focus this much on what I'm sure. doing right now. Yeah, yeah. I so I think it. I'm gonna wait for for a plane because it requires a lot of, of of focusing. But man, I love how that game controls. Sure. Like it. For as weird as it is just being a snake, like it feels right. And when you f- fall or fuck up, you feel like you're responsible yeah, for it. Yeah, well, that like, was the problem with the I, when I or not the problem, but the problem, I guess, with the game and why I agree with the IGN review that I read today or whatever, when it was just like, the, I'm playing it and yeah, I'm like, wow, fuck. I thought I was just going to go through this and be done with the levels. But no, I didn't want to get everything, get all these coins. And I did all stuff and I got all stuff and then I fell and died and I came back and I was like, wait. And I paused it and I lost everything. Yeah. I was like, motherfucking that, that, yeah. checkpoints. That was the moment that I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, very I intense. need to focus on this. Yeah, I can't yeah, yeah. just kind of fuck around. That's uh, the worst feeling. Game, that's like my biggest gaming thing of like ugh, like redoing something or like like losing progress and having to do something again says the guy who played a game five and a half times yeah, yeah. but uh, it, like when you lose it and have to do it again like mm-hmm. that drives me insane yeah anyway I've been happy uh, with, with the Switch so far oh me too but I want to talk about the accessories and, and all that stuff because I've been doing a lot of research I've gotten a whole bunch of shit some I like some I don't like okay so I want to start with the cases sure Ooh, okay. what case are you using so on Amazon these things are back ordered to hell so it's like I was stupid and didn't pre-order a case. Like I had my system, my pro well, controller. You wouldn't think Zelda. you'd need to. Exactly. Like it, it just if I had been buying a Vita 2 or whatever and thought of it as a portable, I would have, but somehow I wasn't thinking I was thinking this is a console and mm. not I was forgetting the portable part. So look for a case, everything's back ordered like 2 3 4 5 months and I finally like I had alert me notices set for like every single case on Amazon uh, cuz GameStop was sold out, Best Buy was sold out. Finally, Amazon for Prime had a um, starter kit, like a PDP starter kit. So I have the Lynx Tunic Edition. It is basically the same as that case on mm-hmm. the inside, but on the outside it is this very ugly, like yep. baby blue, like imitation of his tunic with a bright gold zipper. It's just hideous. So but it'll, it'll get the job done. I was I was thinking of it as a handheld, so I was like, all right, cool. I'm gonna <laughs> get a case. Didn't think I'd have to pre-order it because I'm like, cases are but we did. things that you should get. But we did. You and I both and pre-ordered the looked, same case, and we pre-ordered the the PDP case. So it's this one like is one you're talking about. This is the one with like well, if so you're listening at home, this is the mine's one with like made the by PDP, but it's different. Than oh, that. is it? Is it more similar? Mine's to similar to that on the it's hard case. Thicker. It's a hard case and has room for a charger and it has like a flap with like cartridge. It's so, actually really similar to that one. Go back to this is Kevin's. This is the it's Nintendo the, Collector's Edition the, or the Zelda Breath Sheikah of the Wild Collector's Edition. Yeah. It's fine because it is hard. Yeah, yeah. I really like the inside of it because yeah. it is really, really padded. Yeah. Yeah. And it has room for all the, the stuff. And you can carry a charger and you can carry it. Yeah, has, it has a cool little like, purse handle on the top. And it's going to protect purse handle. <laughs> I, I like don't like the one. design. I don't like how it feels. I personally, I don't like the like. Oh, hey, it's the actual in-game stuff in here. Yeah. It's like just give me You're something that looks sleek this is and cool. cool. This is cool. I, I don't you. like how it feels. Like this Wait, is all. What? What you, I mean, I feels more. I, I mean, I'm hold using it, hold it. like there's way too many edges. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like texture. Like, I mean, yeah, if it was just unnecessary. This, I love, I'd be fine. I love the me heart, too. Yeah. I'm fine with so that. So this is my thing, Kevin. Like, anytime you want to put gold farm in the frame for while I'm talking, <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, like I, I do like this. Um, I'm away from the mic. I like this texture or this mm-hmm. like toughness, and it that feels like it's going to protect it. The minute there's Mario ones, I'm gonna get a cool Mario case. <laughs> like you know, you know, for like each big release, there will be themed merchandise. Mm-hmm. So there will be Mario Kart. There will be Splatoon, which will be cool, bright colors. Well, the more I look at that, I'm realizing my case completely ripped off this one it is identical to this it's the same velcro strap it's this it's well, is it the same number. material too yeah everything I, think, I think it's just the nintendo because this, is, it's, a, this it's is an official this nintendo one yeah this is just so mine's made by pdp but it's like almost a pdp version of this and then the front of it just even uglier if you can believe it so nintendo i think the sheikah slate is cool <laughs> I I I think the, in the game is there's cool. a chic yeah, yeah there is you wouldn't the, know about Nintendo it. Nintendo licensed uh, Hori and um, Hori? and uh, PDP to do a lot of stuff, so yeah. a lot of these are officially licensed. This is a PDP case as well. Oh, so, yeah. I'm dumb. So, so I the, so I do sense. have the exact same case. It's just a different outside. Yeah, so including the handle. I like things when they're sleek and a bit more fashionable when it sure. comes to the the cases and stuff. So when we saw this one, this is the charcoal the PDP, PDP case. premium case is that, what they call this it. Is the one we That's the one Finnegan has too. I like that. And one. I'm like, I like it visually. I was like, I definitely this is the one that I want. Now that I have it, fuck this. Oh no. Ooh. Take that. Don't worry. Sorry. <laughs> Patreon didn't see that. Patreon you're here. Have a nice camera. I hit the camera. <laughs> <laughs> didn't mean to do that. Um, that's a piece of shit. Hate the case. Do not buy that case. Wow. I got one. Greg got one. Both of us were like, fuck it. Well, the weird I thing is like, there's. There's also different versions of that case. So there's one with like a bunch of Mario coins and stars yeah. on it. There's like all these different like outer designs. Mm-hmm. My the, problem with it is just it's got such. I don't feel this protects anything. No, I there's agree. no protection. But, but that, it's that's even worse than that, that one though. too. Let me see it. The worst thing about it is not only does it not protect shit. Mm-hmm. When you go on the inside, 
Yeah. Just his what? weird bag. And there's not even... Everything's uh, going to scratch the screen. Yeah, Everything that's Everything in this. The there's game... Even, you're, you're telling me that you're going to put it against the actual game cards themselves or against this freaking... Like, this reminds Mesh. me of, like, when you go to Ross to buy swim trunks. Yep. I like, I like swim this. Trunks, I like it. having this, uh, this strap, this Velcro strap to keep it secure. It feels really secure. Yeah, like, I, I like traveling with it. I also, because I'm extra paranoid, I put, like, an, an extra microfiber cloth on top of the screen and then put this down mm, so it doesn't scratch mm. it. But the, see, my this came with a microfiber cloth, so I'll give oh. a shout out to them for that. Yeah, that, that's the this PDP one. one. We, the, see, we had ordered this one, the charcoal PDP one, and then the problem was it didn't come on time. Yeah. So I was walking around with my Switch wrapped up in a T-shirt, and then yeah. Nintendo sent me this one, the official, the official Nintendo yeah. Yeah. one. That's and like that one smoother. is a kickstand, which I think is cool, but it doesn't protect. As a kickstand? Yeah. So like this thing, if you take that out. This thing beautiful. Out oh, that's really what that good. is? Yeah, I've never can, ever folded yeah, it out. You could mount, you could basically do it like that and then keep it. Yeah. So if you're on a plane and want to mm -hmm. play like with your broken See, what I like yeah. is just, that's a lot of good padding. I put it there, yep. pad it up, done, and then I feel like I'm padded up. So that's my thing is then I wanted the Nintendo one after I saw yours. I'm like, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah. Sold out to hell. Of I eventually, I got in when Amazon had like a, a quick ship and I'm like, fuck yeah, I need this thing. But I love this case. It doesn't offer as much as a hard case would, but I think it's fine because I'm never throwing my shit around. Yeah. So, yeah, so what, I'm okay what with it. Altano has both. He has this one, the Shika Slate one, and that Nintendo one. And what he does is that's like his throw it in my bag, go to work. Morgana! Morgana, no! <laughs> uh, that's his like throw it in his bag, go to work. Uh, at work, Jose has all the Zelda amiibos, so mm -hmm. we scan them every day for all the crap you can get. Nice. Um, so Works. a lot of us bring our switches to work. But then this one is like his like let's travel, let's mm. go on a trip, let's bring a charger. Mm -hmm. and, and like that's kind of the boat I'm in where. The one I have is just hideous, but at least it'll get the job done and protect it. And then down the road, I really do think I'll get kind of a slimmer. Like, I really like that one. I love this. It has yeah. everything that I need. However, the one that I really want, Kev, if you can bring that up, I don't Ooh. know where, I guess on the... The one you just had? The Waterfield yeah. Way one? Yeah, the Waterfield one. You Kev. had it, yeah, that one. Oh, damn. That's, that's now, like... If you wow. remember, this is this is Waterfield Way, mm -hmm. uh, SF Bags on Twitter. You might remember these guys from Podcast Beyond because they made my Vita case, Ooh. which is a smaller version of this. Got and I right. love that Vita case but it's because on the inside, it's super soft and awesome and it's protective and padded. But the problem with this one is that this has been also back ordered to yep. fucking hell. So it's back yep. ordered to hell. It is $80, so it's also pricey, but it is very much a premium case. And they have a giant one that you can put the dock in and the power brick in but and all this, this stuff in. But even this, you can fit the dock, but you can fit a lot more yep. than, than you can in this. Like I I've think you can get the USB adapter in there. Get a whole bunch of games and some even extra Joy Cons and shit. Like that's my Joy. That sounds intense and awesome. I've seen like even crazier ones. Like there are like actual like messenger bags with like a switch section inside of them. Basically, well, mm -hmm. uh, these guys have that. Oh, that's basically that. it's not yeah, this yeah. one, but they, I mean, this is really tiny. But they do have bigger ones as there well. There you go, that one right there. Yeah, that's like that is. This intense. is like you are that you is are like, all pro Mario Kart. Well, you know what? Like what I can see that being is like probably what like. IGN is gonna get to mm. like carry them to events and stuff like mm. when we're gonna need to like plug in for direct feed and all that like that makes sense This seems a little bit like overkill for yeah. like going to LA for a weekend Exactly yeah, strap yeah. on my switch case, but I, I definitely once once it kind of settles down and these get a little bit more Accessible, I think I might bite the bullet and get one because it's classy. They're really nice I like the leather and I love your Vita case too. Yeah. So like, I'm totally but are you having having your Vita case and having this one What are you thinking? I mean, I don't I, this is fine. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm more in the Goldfarb camp of when there's a cool one that I think has a branding on it that I like when Patapon's on there or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's about be the one I jump over. And don't get. think that's gonna happen. I don't think there's gonna be a <laughs> Patapon Nintendo Switch even, case. No. Uh -huh. But well, there when there's a good dry ones. bones, when there's a good mm -hmm. dry bones, there'll be like a flaming toast case thing. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, this uh, the Shika Slate one. This guy, the Shika Slate one, the, the collector's edition one. Like in the same as mine, I would feel so weird pulling out in public. Whereas like that one you were just showing me that like SF bags one yeah that looks rad. like a, something an adult will carry exactly yeah. like that no one's gonna know that that's not just but then like you bring a, it out you exactly. start playing your fucking neon blue toy so who cares <laughs> dude this one's hot though look at that shit no I no that wasn't a knock I'm just oh. saying how long do we want to keep up the facade that we're adults oh. until true. you play your fucking Fair toy I'm, a, I'm not a fan of the adult thing but I mean this, they literally were like hey Tim we're gonna give you your blue and I'm like all right I yeah. can't say no to it if it was any other blue I wouldn't do it that also like. Even that, even with the blue or even with the red, like that still looks more adult than like a big folding clamshell, like the three D. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah, no, that that's true. So, he, my so you're happy with your purchase of the Joy Cons? Oh yeah, blue Joy Cons. I mean, like, so yeah. Moving on to before we move to controllers, my apologies. Real quick, I'll I want to talk about the uh, me, screen wow. protectors. There's a lot of yeah. screen protectors that I do not recommend. Don't at do all. them at all. They're stupid. Don't do them at all. 
Uh, but if you want naked. to, if you want to, uh, the there's all the, the 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 PDP ones and the official ones. Stay away from those because those are like shitty plastic, and they're not going to feel good. The Hori one is really okay. Protect the the Hori Premium one is be- it's better than the PDP one because I tried both. Are, but I mean, they're both shitty plastic. But they're still not like tempered glass. Or so the yeah. tempered yeah, glass, yeah. they're cheap as hell now. Yeah, ten dollars. There's uh, three different brands of people that I, I know that recommend them. Um, there's the Amfilm. One, the Orsley, that's O-R-Z-L-Y, screen protector. And then the one that I actually played with is the Anchor Glass Guard Premium. They're all between 8 and $10. Wow. So it's like if you really want to have a screen protector, I think you're going to be fine. Or just grow up and don't use a screen protector. It's stupid. I'm less worried about the glass cracking. I'm more worried about scratches because yeah. this thing seems really susceptible to scratches. So. But the scratches come in oh. is the dock safety. Ooh. So I own two of these. There's been a oh. been a lot of of you know scuttlebutt on the internet about oh you got to be careful because Nintendo are idiots and designed the dock stupid and they did. So if you look inside, it's padded on one of the sides. Oh, they can totally see that. Yeah, but it's padded on this side. It's not padded on this side. So when you put it in, eventually around the screen, like the bezel of the screen, it's going to get scratched. And you can find a whole bunch of pictures online. To be honest, of a bunch of fucking idiots that are trying to scratch the dogs. Jamming it in. Right, yeah, like, yeah. come on. But it's the internet. That's what it is. Yep. But to get ahead of this, there's multiple things you can do. You can just go to a hardware store and buy little the rubber. Oh, the little nubs? Rub, rubber nubs. Yeah, and that's yeah. like, oh, they're like $2. That's a good you can idea. just put them on the inside and sure. you're totally fine. Um, if you want something a little more you know, visual, yeah. go on Etsy and just search for Nintendo Switch dock. If you, do, you double back, uh, dock sock. That's what the dock sock. dock sock. If you, if you double back and you put, can you click on the Zelda map one? This is the one I bought. I have two of these now for the two docks I have at home. Mm. I, I bought it because it was one of those things. I, I was noticing what they're talking about here, yeah. that there's like smudges there. And I was like, I don't care if it happens, but if I can protect it, why, why yeah, not? 100%. Why not? Does it look cool? Yeah, I think so. There's can a whole bunch. I mean, you could just get colors. You could get. Oh, let's see. There are. Is, are there persona ones? Can someone make me a persona? I'm sure, I'm sure there's. I'm a sure there is. Please let me know if anyone makes a persona dog sock. <laughs> but they range between ten and twenty dollars. So if yeah, you they were dirt that, cheap when the ones go like for that. it. But I, I think I might do just the rubber. Yeah, th- that seems things. like my thing with the dock. Like I, we were just talking about bags and looking like toys and stuff. For someone with as many toys on his desk as I have, my apartment itself is actually like fairly adult and like I, my entertainment center like looks good. So I do think like if I'm, I still haven't taken that out of the box. If I'm going to put the dock up as much as I like would probably put a dock sock on if I had it, I uh, want it to look classy still. Yeah. And I feel like the, the black looks fine. It looks fine. And so like putting things on the inside is more appealing to me mm-hmm. than putting that whole like glove over it. Mm-hmm. But that said, like I will do whatever to prevent my like, you know, 250 or $300 thing from getting scratched up. Absolutely. Um, so you were talking about the the controllers. So yeah, the I mean, like I was wondering if you are, if you like you're fine with your Joy-Con decision yeah. here. Yeah. So I I've mean, talked about this on the show before. I was happy. Like I was really hurt when Nintendo first announced their shit and you could only get the I neon in the two mm-hmm. different colors because yeah, yeah. like fuck. But now I'm happy because I'm like my shit looks unique in the grand scheme of things compared to everyone mm-hmm. else's. There's other people that have this obviously, sure. but. Like I'm like, all right, cool. I like that mine's a little bit different. See, the Joy Cons come down to me in the same way of like, I I like the kind of funny blue, but obviously it's your blue now. I can't take it, and so and not not what I and I wouldn't take it either because I don't love it. Mm. And but it is for me of like, what's gonna happen when they start releasing Joy Cons in crazy colors and it's the clear throwback to N64. It is the solid gold or or just like the Famicom color. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. GameCube color schemes on there. And And that's what's cool is like unlike with 3DS where like every time they released a new Pokemon one or a new Famicom one I was like oh like I want that but I'm not gonna replace my whole system. system. But now these are like obviously I assume these are region free so like you'll be able to import like a cool rare Japanese one or like Not to mention that it it just it just it's added benefit to you because they are still just controllers. All right, cool. Somebody else is here. Here play Mario Kart with this rather totally. than us having to figure out how to do this. Yeah, yeah so because of this, for that. I had to buy the extra pair, and that's eighty. I got it for eighty dollars. It was steep, but I was like, I know I wanted an extra set for multiplayer games at yeah. my house. I wanted to make sure that I was and for know, even when they're just at least battery. had. I wanted four controllers, so I bought two pro controllers and one set of Joy Cons just so I was set. Um, that was eighty bucks. Now you can find a set for sixty bucks on Amazon, mm. like as low as sixty bucks. You, yep. Like if you just wait and find the right time, Amazon's been super good about getting the Nintendo shit like below MSRP, which I don't even understand how they're doing it. But especially if you have Prime, like you can get a lot of their accessories really cheap. Yeah. Um, so keep your eye out there. Uh, they sell them individually, the left and right, for fifty dollars. I don't even understand who the audience is for that. I guess it's just if you bought. I yeah. think this is what Pear did. I think he bought the blue and red one, and then he wanted. 
he like kind of like you. He wanted blue and blue, but didn't care about having an extra red, so he just bought one blue. I, I I think that just sounds so weird to me when it's like you could have just had a two reds and had, had another controller. Yeah. You know, but I don't know. Whatever. Pear doesn't want to play with his kids. Everybody knows that. Yeah, he doesn't like his so kids. So I'm calling out Pear. I might that, be wrong that, about Pear's that's Joy-Con what I heard. situation. He's, uh, he's in a car, <laughs> put, uh, slam it on the wheel. <laughs> so then there's also the, the Joy-Con grip, which was the it's is this 30, the charging 30 one? bucks. This okay. is the charge grip. Yeah. yeah. So the Switch comes with the non charge one, which is insulting. Yep. Super upsetting. <laughs> I got the charging one. I haven't used it ever. I, I think, honestly, the grip is. A, I like that one comes in the box for if you really just don't want to shell out for a pro controller happened like once I finally held them both because when we were writing about them both I was like oh like maybe one is more ergonomic and one is lighter and blah blah, blah. having played them both like I will never ever use the grip if I have a pro controller Fuck option yes. I will Fuck never because yes. I don't like these little baby buttons but <laughs> I do think that this is a totally serviceable controller specifically for we're playing multiplayer Mario Kart Whoever gets stuck with this isn't going to hate everything. Yeah. In the same way that on the Wii U, it was like whoever gets stuck with the controller, the sideways like, it was mode insulting, or whatever. You, you know, <laughs> you, get, you get the steering wheel. Fuck. That's, that's why it's frustrating that the charging one didn't come with it because it's like I have this essentially useless thing where if I get a second set of Joy Cons, I'll probably keep them on that conveniently to know where they are, but then it doesn't do anything for me. And well, I mean, so the, the good thing, the, the reasoning I have for why it's okay that the one it came with doesn't charge is that you're. Joy Cons are always going to be on your system charging, anyways. When it's and if you only have yeah, so if you only have one uh, set of Joy Cons, they're always going to be charged. <laughs> yeah. So you don't need to be charging with the dock because if you're using a Pro Controller, you're charging that separately, right? I think if I if I hadn't gotten a Pro Controller, I imagine my setup in the world in a world where I in uh, a world I have a uh, charging grip and I don't have a Pro Controller. I think what I pictured was having an extra set always charging on the charging grip that I could swap out for the ones on the system itself. Yeah. Um, I think now I've pivoted to once I eventually hook it up to my TV. Yeah, exactly. That set will always be charging and I'll have a pro controller. And when I eventually get a second set of joy cons, I guess at that point I'll buy either a charging grip for them or just, I don't know. I don't know how I'll do it. Yeah. And then pro controller. I could not say you need it enough. It's like great. this thing is yep. beautiful. Love the big ass buttons. Look at them. Look at They're those. Big. Those are big. Look buttons. at those Kev. Kev, have you seen those these are big real buttons? buttons? Those are real those buttons. Are really those are really big buttons. Damn baby buttons. What? <laughs> Good lord. Anyway, this thing, while expensive as hell, I think you need one. Yeah. Uh, for the Switch's future. Oh, yeah. The second I play that thing on TV, that's what I'm using. Um, the AC adapter, $30. You got an extra one yeah. just because of how we do things here. and like. No, well, I mean, I got an extra one for my house. because I, I. Oh, really? Yeah, I was like, I don't want to keep moving this thing, the whole dock and all that shit back and forth. So I, have a I bought an extra dock as well. So I have See, a dock in the bedroom, a dock in the living room. This is where Power I love flexible. Nintendo and where they did it right in that, uh, like when the first Vita came out, it used a proprietary port. Yep. And when I got the Slim, it was so nice because I had charging cables for USB that already. Yeah. Like my laptop, I got a Micro. new MacBook. It uses USB-C anyway. Mm -hmm. So like I have a USB charger, USB-C charger in my bag at all times. Yep. So now I just carry one extra cable and I can literally go charge it from my laptop or use my laptop charger, which is like nice. the most convenient thing in the world. Yeah, and, and in addition to that, so the what I was talking about Amazon earlier, so it's $30 for the Nintendo official adapter, but yeah, you could just use any USB um, AC adapter, but you can get the Nintendo one for $20 on Amazon. Wow. So like, I don't know how they're doing that, but yeah. but they, they figured out a way. And uh, USB-C uh, cables are super cheap. Like, Kev, I, don't, I can't see the price here. Six nine yeah. nine. Well, you can get an extra plus cable. Plus one comes with the pro controller, which is yeah. so yeah. cool. Like, so you I get that, then you're good. Totally didn't think they would do totally, that. Totally, yeah. The PlayStation model. Yeah, like, exactly. Here's this fucking controller, no extra cords for you. Yeah, it was like it was it such out. a weird feeling, like opening up that pro controller and being like, I would not have even been mad if this wasn't here because I didn't expect it. But having it was such a nice, like, oh, awesome. So now yeah. that's just in my bag. Um, I recommend the Anchor one, the Anchor Power Line. Anchor is pretty much, in my opinion, is one of those brands that in the last couple of years I've been like, I just trust you guys. Yeah. Like your products have always been been good. I love their their cables. Uh, I love all like I bought their little bricks for the wall for traveling when you charge your iPhones and stuff. And they're super good. Um, I bought that Anchor Power Core. And then yeah, so the Power Cores. That's a whole other other ball game here. Sure. So ball battery racks. packs. Yeah. There's a lot of rules you're dealing with here. If you're trying to buy one to charge your switch, switch battery, it's going to die, right? Yep. Doesn't have that much juice in it. If you want to recharge it right now, there's no great option to have a, a battery uh, pack that will charge while you play in a way that works totally perfectly. You right now have this anchor. Yeah. Power core, something or other. I it's what the, the one Kevin has up the there. 2600. The, yeah. 26, eight. So that'll charge it, but it's not while you're playing. Yeah. Two, six, eight hundred to be. So to be clear, when you say while you're playing, all of us immediately think Zelda, which seems to be more of a power drain. 
it does seem like other games drain the battery way slower. Yeah. So it might not be like like I'm mostly playing Zelda on this thing. I would imagine it'll get better once you're playing, you know, Shovel Knight or. or so something. I'm not an expert when it comes to to power and how the volts and amps and all that shit work. But from what I understand, it doesn't matter what game you're playing. It's just this, a system thing. So it seems like this will charge it at some stats I was seeing was something like at a one percent for five minutes mm, type yeah. thing. No matter what you're playing, because gotcha, it's just gotcha. more of like trying to give it. Because it's the what I what I have here is. So you Zelda need to have faster, at least uh, an output of five volts and three amps okay. for it to even charge the the switch. So a lot of the little tiny lipstick battery chargers, those just won't even work. Right. Yep. So this is kind of the bare minimum when it comes to to charging it. However, this thing will charge the switch three to four full times. That's awesome. So it's a worthy investment. But what's your experience been with it? So, I mean, it's limited, right? So what, what it was that we went to Boston on the flight out there, I had a power outlet in my seat, so everything was perfect. And then on the flight back, I had the power outlet, but it wasn't working. So it's like traditional Virgin America yep. bullshit. So <laughs> I, it, it clonked out three hours in, so I ordered this guy. I've only had to use it in passing. It is that thing of like, I can't tell if it's, well, I put it in and when I was in and it showed that it was going while I was playing and I, it definitely seemed to slow the battery drain, if that makes sense. Well, that's because that's what it is. It's the 1% for okay, five okay. minutes, and so which I means you're, when you're playing, the percents might be going down faster than it's charging. Gotcha. Okay, okay. I see. Now I understand your that thing. Makes sense. But for me, it seemed to maintain for a little bit at least where it did start cl clicking down, but not drastically. I did. Sl I was able to stop the bleed for a second. Uh, the one thing, though, that I didn't like, so I stopped, was like it was get the, the switch seemed like it was getting really hot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm not about that life. That always freaks me out, especially on planes. Yeah. 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 So, but, uh, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it was just me because that happens with my iPhone and with like portable chargers as well. And I just got over that. That's going to happen. That's going to heat yeah. up or whatever. I just took a GoPro out of my pocket that was super hot. And see yeah. so, what happens. Right? And that's the thing like having played, having like obsessively played Pokemon Go, especially early on, but like even oh, still yeah, yeah. a little bit and like carrying all these battery packs and like, keeping my phone charging and stuff. Like those things got like to the point of like burning my skin hot. And like that is not great. And like I, I feel less concerned, especially when I had my older iPhone. Like I felt less concerned than I would about Switch, especially yeah. with saves currently only being tied to that yep. one system. Like it just yeah. the second it starts getting hot, I I kind of freak out. So like I'm I'm excited to see that it seems like a lot of people are making like battery packs that are more dedicated for this. geared towards the Switch. Like people are advertising them as like yeah, this yeah. Is yep. for I think Anchor's Switch. doing that. So yeah. so a lot of people are doing it. The first ones out the gate right now are Razer with their Razer Power Bank. It's $150, so it's a little on the pricier side. Uh, right now you have to sign up for notifications for when it's going to be yeah, available. Yeah, for when it's, it's, like, it's not even out there. But it's not even made for the Switch. This is made to charge laptops. Mm. Yeah. So like, we're talking about some beefy power here where you're getting 15 volts with 2.6 amps, which sounds a lot more than the 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 five necessary for for this guy. Sure. So yeah, it's like you, you're, you're going to be like, good. Don't you like multiply two of the numbers or something? I don't know. <laughs> Fuck like, we ain't electricians. I just read <laughs> yeah. and I then got some like feedback from people that have tried different things. I'm so afraid on the other end because my MacBook charger is 87 watts and I'm and it's USB C and it charges it fine. But I'm like, oh, this, I hope I'm not like slowly Overclock killing it, it or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, if you want to sign up, the I'll put the link in the description for that for the Razer Power Bank. But there will be other ones coming soon. But the other thing here is like, if you can hold out, hold out. Like these oh, battery yeah, yeah, yeah. chargers are only going to get cheaper. And yeah, well, that was my thing of like, I'll pick this up now. It wasn't that expensive, and it was just like, I need to charge a million things anyway. You know what I mean? I just put it in my backpack and never think about it. I've I've charged I've charged the battery pack once. I've used it once on the switch, and I still have full power. So yeah. it's like it, it's replacing the little laptop or the little uh, cell phone batteries mm, I carry mm. with me usually. Um, the last two things I want to talk about are the the Ethernet connector. So yes. there's no Ethernet port on the the dock itself, and like not that it really matters for anything. Like the Wi-Fi has been fine for me for downloading games, but there hasn't really been a multiplayer game yet. So once Mario Kart and Splatoon come, we'll see how necessary it is. Uh, the the official one is like ridiculously priced. I think it's like thirty dollars. Yeah, any USB Ethernet. Cable will work. So if you just go on Amazon, you can get one of those for like three dollars. I still actually fine. had mine from the Wii. So if you have one for the Wii or Wii U, it works totally yeah. perfectly. So I do want to give a, a shout out here to Canaries in the Coal Mine. I didn't listen to because when they announced the Switch and they're like, it doesn't have Netflix, it doesn't have this, it doesn't have an internet browser. I was one of the people like, oh, I got all that on my other things. Why do I fucking care? Jump cut to me in my Austin hotel room getting codes for new Switch games, and I'm like, fuck yeah, connect to the hotel internet. Just fucking times out. Yep, because there's no window now to pop up and say, "Oh, hey, are you a Sheridan guest or whatever?" Hit OK, put in your room number and other shit. Oh. And so that's the same problem. Terrible. Three, so 3DS had, wow. if you have like a MacBook, you connect to a thing and uh, Wi-Fi pops up and you type in the password and whatever. Uh, on a 3DS, you had three saved connections, yep. and so because you had to save the connections ahead of time and do the internet test, you could never get that window to pop up. So it's frustrating that they didn't learn from that yeah. and make hotel Wi-Fi work. Um, 
Man, I've had so many Wi-Fi issues with my Switch. Like, I basically have to connect it at work. If I have it this far from my router, like three inches from my router, it still won't wow. always read it. Um, mm. And if it does, it'll be at <laughs> one bar. Because apparently it's just really susceptible to interference from other Wi-Fi devices, people were saying. Interesting. So, I've had a lot of trouble, so I'm definitely going to do hardwired. Yeah, I've, had, like, a, I've had it. It works. It has worked great at home downloading stuff. Games go super quickly. I have, we have good internet home. But then when I was at uh, Rooster Teeth and in the Achievement Hunter office, it just could not download... Mm. Whatever I was downloading, it was maybe it was maybe it was graceful or it was the other. Oh, uh, Puyo Puyo Tetris. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't had any any issues with the the Wi-Fi yet, but I, I have had random issues with the Switch where three times now it's just completely locked up. Huh. Ooh, that's yeah. Not good. And I then I had to actually do the thing where you hold the power button down for fifteen seconds to like hard reset it. Wow. Kind of sucks, but I it's crazy how more of that. like in the same way I did when I warmed to my Vita, like when I play it, I feel so comfortable with it now, and like I like I, I have mine set to like the dark the night mode yep. or whatever like and i just i like the menus like i like i'm so excited to do stuff with it because i feel like right now it is just my zelda machine sure. and i'm excited for when the full online service is available and when i am like browsing the eShop and getting virtual console and doing all of that stuff and that's why like right now having wi-fi issues hasn't been that big of a deal but it does make me nervous for later yeah so i'm yeah, glad i have that ethernet adapter as like a kind of a backup plan. yeah and the, the last accessory to talk about is memory cards which is mm. one of the most important accessories but i feel like one of the least important right now just because there's nothing to download yeah um but this is going to become a problem sooner than later uh it's another thing like the portable chargers where i would recommend holding out as long as possible because the prices drop on them so quickly if you need one or really want one now the best one to get is the SanDisk Ultra Micro SD card that's just the, has the fastest read and write speed, and like you're you're going to be good with that. Is that the two hundred future proofed? The thing is, it comes in different. The the things that are worth it right now. There's the one hundred twenty eight, which is forty four dollars. So that is the most like you're getting your best bang for your buck in terms of quality, space, and price. Uh, the two hundred gig one, which is a weird price for memory card or yeah. a weird Capacity, number. Yeah, yeah. two hundred is seventy seven dollars. So it's like. Not too crazy if you really want that much space. Where we're getting crazy is two fifty six is two hundred and forty two dollars. Yeah. So like you can kind of see that threshold, and I imagine within a year everything will be pushed down even further. Like so that was six. what I used all my because Nintendo, bless them, never drops the price of their first party games. So like if you go to buy like a used copy of Three D World, it's often still like fifty sixty dollars. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what that meant was that the Amazon trade-in for all the games I bought over the Wii U's life was still crazy high. Mm. So I just traded in like my whatever, like 10, 15 first party games. And that was enough for, I just bought a 256 gar gig mm. card with credit. So like I have a 256 in my system because I love them, but I know Nintendo and I was just so paranoid about, hey, like you can't swap memory cards or it's tied to your profile forever or, or whatever it ends up being. So I just wanted smart, high capacity. I can go digital. I can, you know, not worry about losing cartridges and all that stuff. Yeah, no, that's so, a good call. But it, it was expensive. And like I, if I had been, I mean, it, it was real money, obviously. But I think if I had been adding that to my purchase price, like I never would have gotten that mm -hmm. high. I think that 200 gig or that 128 seemed like the best. Seems like a good thing. I didn't even yeah. buy one yet. I'm, just, I'm holding until I need one. Well, Amazon I mean, that's Prime the thing. Like, days. right now, so Zelda, I think, is uh, like 13, 15, yep. somewhere there. Yeah, 13, and then, somewhere. like, Lego City, if you wanted it, came out today and it's like seven. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like it's getting there if you're yeah. just using the internal memory. But even then, like, the next real thing that isn't just like a, a tiny game is going to be Mario Kart. And you have, you know, a month in, from the time we're recording this until that comes out. I think. You're going to see micro SD. They said this supports the standard, which is up to like two terabytes or something. So like yeah. you're going to see the the five twelves and the one terabytes over the next few years. So I agree. If you can hold out, like wait, because yep. that two hundred fifty six gig card in like two years is going to be nothing. It's yep. going to be so cheap. Exactly. Um, so yeah, all the the ones that we recommend will be in the description of this video. You can get them on Amazon. Some of them are a couple other places. But yeah, there you go. That's cool. Next topic. You. The dark night of news. I want to talk about news at IGN. Okay. So I worked with you for five years, give or take, Ish, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, like you were there the whole time I was there, weren't you? Well, I mean, I left. So I worked with you from what, like probably 2012 to 2014. Oh, okay. So fuck. Well, I was way off. <laughs> well, because wow. then I left. I and never. Came back. I got, oh, I guess actually no. I guess I was there before you, and then yeah, then you left. No, I so. started. So I started because I was there in 2010. Oh, so you were there for me, yeah? Because yeah. I started as contract in like. August ish of 2011, okay. and then I became full time in October of 2011, and then um, I was there until February 2014. Mm -hmm. Left for 14 months, 13 months. Came back in May of 2015. So you were doing news, yeah. Then you came back to run news. Yes, yeah. 
So okay, what does all that mean? And what does news mean at IGN? So we have a, we divide things a long time ago. We had content teams like divided by the content type. So PlayStation, Nintendo, PC, uh, all that. And then now we did it instead by rather than content in terms of manufacturer, we have it by content like previews, reviews, news, features um, are kind of our four big verticals. Uh, and so I run the news part of that um, executive editor of news. And then I have a counterpart for previews, reviews and features. So with, when you when you you being in charge of news, is that news in terms of article and video? Sort of. So it's like news is like this weird foundation where, um, yeah, like we like I oversee the news video team and then the fix is sort of separate from me, but I still work with those guys a lot. Um, And I guess if the fix has like a huge mistake or problem, that's probably ultimately on me. But like we basically do it as, um, yeah, like announcements, press release, you know, blasts, things like that. And things announced during press conferences are all news. And then we consider... There's this gray area that other sites call a report, which is sort of a newsy feature, which uh, would be kind of like a, a long form interview or things like that. That get, becomes more of a gray area, but it's still pretty much under me uh, unless it becomes much more like big picture focus. So for people out there that read video game news every day, they go to the IGNs, the game spots, wherever, or Kotaku's and like kind of just read through all the articles that, that were written. That's where they get all of that. Where do you get the news? Uh, mostly directly from publishers. Like we're obviously getting press releases and, and, you know, every morning checking PlayStation blog, Ubisoft blog, like all that stuff for announcements that go wide. And then other things that we get exclusively that we either negotiate for or pitch for, or that come out of, um, you know, IGN first, maybe we go somewhere to see a game. And then while we're there, they're like, Oh, by the way, we just started working the sequel. And then we have a story like that. It's kind of news is a weird thing because it's unpredictable. Right. So like, there's no, I come in with like 10 things I'm expecting to do that day. But then if there's a major announcement, like um, surprise, we announced a sequel or, you know, really unpredictable things like, you know, a death or, a, you know, a, a major person um, leaving a company or things like that. We kind of have to stay on our toes. Mm-hmm. So I think um, where do I get the news kind of from everywhere? I, I am constantly looking at Twitter, looking at Facebook, uh, reading through blogs, looking at my inbox. We get tips from people. Uh, it, it kind of comes from everywhere. And it's sort of... Uh, sort of feels like a a little overwhelming at times, like kind of looking down the barrel of that gun and and thinking about like kind of the triage of like in the moment, like what is the most important thing and what are we focusing on? Um, And all of that is just sort of the aggregation side of it. Then there's also the generating original news. So the conducting interviews and being proactive about if someone does announce something, how are we following up and and who are we on the phone with to be like, well, what else can we get out of this? And, Mm -hmm. And where, what is the, okay, so this is what you said in the press release. What did you not say? You know, what are our questions still? It's stuff like that. So it, it can be a little taunting, but yeah. there's there's a lot to it. So NeoGAF is kind of the, the biggest video game website where I'd say the most people interested in video game news and industry side stuff usually they're are. For the scoops, the they're rumors. For the scoops. That so like the leaks. The, oh, yeah, and Reddit as well. Yeah. But they're, they're kind of doing all the work themselves because they, they want to be doing it. How often do you, does IGN get news stories from NeoGAF? Well, I mean, I would say like the experiential things like, uh, so, you know, whatever, uh, why can I not think of a multiplayer game, but call of duty launches and, uh, like there are server problems or there's, oh my God, if you, if you choose this obscure combination of classes, like you actually can't connect, but everybody else can, or things like that. Like the things that only come from gameplay, that is where Reddit and NeoGAF are incredible because they just by virtue of the volume of people are going to encounter things that we might not encounter as far as like seeing a blog post first or something like, you know, we're, we're, if we're doing our jobs, right. Or seeing that at the same time they are. So if a NeoGAF thread pops up a lot of the time, it's like, Oh, like Mass Effect Andromeda has been delayed. We might've known that under embargo from EA. We might've just seen the blog post at the same time they did, or the tweet or wherever the source was, or maybe it was even said on our show, or maybe it was said on a GameSpot show. And mm-hmm. so we have to source that. Like, I think GAF just kind of has a, a wider set of eyes than we do, but, uh, for the most part, like I would say it, it's rarer for us to find out something from them than, than the opposite. So you mentioned getting tips earlier. How often does that happen? Because what is that, like an email address or something? Yeah, so we have just news tips at IGN, um, or I have my DMs open, and that's a lot of the, like, um, you know, hey, I work at GameStop, and we heard about this, or, mm. or hey, like, I just got laid off from this publisher, and, like, we were, at the time, doing this, and I'm really frustrated, like, we'd love to show it off, and stuff like that. And I, I, I think we've we're doing 
a little less of that than I think we were when I was more in the trenches. Um, it, it's something I want to kind of get back to. Like, I think like the Jason Friars and Patrick Klepeks of the world are so, they are dedicating so much more time and resources, but they're also just better at sniffing for that stuff. And so like, they have a lot of like really cool scoops and things that I feel like um, we still love to get when we can, but we're, we're doing a little less. Mm-hmm. Um, but that stuff, yeah, it'll come from, yeah, like fans of the shows who, who, you know, because they know us and like us will decide to share something with us or people who are devs or people who just tell us things in confidence that we're not necessarily reporting on, but, but that we can kind of keep kind of in our back pockets and that we know and that provide context for other announcements and things like that. How do you kind of balance that? Like the ethics of reporting the news, but also not betraying the friendships you have, like specifically you're talking about like, Oh, if you were to go to an IGN first or something and you find something else there, do you run that stuff by them before you write the news article? It would depend. I mean, like if they invite us into their house and we like see something we weren't supposed to see, we're not going to like take it and put it in our pocket and just run it. But in different circumstances, like if we find out something that, you know, an ex employee tells us or, or someone, you know, their sister works there and told them something or whatever, like we'll verify that information, but maybe it is something that we run that maybe the publisher wasn't ready to announce or, you know, like way back in the day, uh, we heard about the telltale game of Thrones game before telltale had announced it at the VGAs that year. And we, you know, double confirmed it and made sure it was real. And then we ran that news ahead of time. Like occasionally I think that can make uh, publishers mad or, or, you know, like you, you hear Jason from Kotaku talking all the time about like the things they've run into with being blacklisted and, and stuff like that. I think it's, it's kind of a balance, right? It's kind of like how important do we feel that information is? How confident are we that it's legit before we, you know, run it and hurt our own reputation or mislead our audience or, mm-hmm. or things like that? Where do you come down on the ethics of leaks? I think whenever we talk about a story in the morning show of this is, you know, Destiny 2's leaks or whatever, blah, 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 there's rumor, that, you know, there's not rumors, there's comments that like, oh, this sucks for those people. And not even Destiny 2, because that's just whatever, a game yeah. stop, you're ahead by a few days. But when it is like that time that guy snuck in, just walked into an office and like walked up and ate lunch and, and like, yeah. yeah and like wandered around and just found everything. I forget what game that was. It was up north, but like, yeah. or all the Kotaku Assassin's Creed reveals and yeah. things like that. That are, I mean, like ethics is the word we're for, right? Like, I don't. I think if you like stole it, if someone like hacked into a network and and illegally got it or something, that's not great. Um, I think there are a lot of reasons people do it. Like, for example, like, and I was like very briefly and in, in a marketing capacity on the dev side, so it's like it's weird for me because like I've seen how hard people work on things that we take for granted. How a texture that you probably walked by and didn't notice might have been three months of someone's life that they didn't have dinner with their kids and that they, you know, like really sacrificed for. And so I get why sometimes that's at odds with maybe the PR plan for a game. And if you're a dev who worked really hard on something and then it's not gonna be announced for another year and you're like, oh, I just want it out in the world. Like I get why people would be motivated to talk to the press and would put that out there. Um, I think when when they introduce that stuff to us, if they bring it to us and we verify that it's real, I don't consider it unethical. I think it, it's our jobs. You know, if we know that information and we're positive it's true and we think our audience will find it interesting, like I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing to put out there because like my job isn't to maintain Ubisoft's PR plan. Like sure. that's just not what I do. Um, that said, I, I do think there's like this weird, like when I first started in this job and I would find something that someone put on LinkedIn that they weren't supposed to, like I would like lose sleep over running that story. Like it, like it made me feel like the most awful person to be like, you put this out there and you weren't supposed to. And I put it on fucking IGN yeah. and now it's everywhere. And like that person, like we would have those situations where someone would be like, Hey, can you take down the story? Like I wasn't supposed to say that. And it's like, well, no, no like he's on the bottle on that. One. Yeah. And so it's like a weird, yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, it's not like I like, yeah, got another one or something like it's not like I take pride in that, but it's also I don't necessarily consider it unethical to to draw attention to that information that was publicly available. Is it a fine line to walk to go from you're doing the leaks? This is what it, I mean, you confirm that it's real. But then, like you said, you know, it is PR blasts from people. It is the it, there are the connections. I mean, I, I it really it, it has to be case by case, right? Because I feel like it's so if you put a blanket rule over it, I think it becomes a lot harder in situations like so like one of the weirdest things is like when like not even necessarily us, but like the press reports on layoffs and the people that company mm. don't know yet. Um. And it's stuff like that where I think those are where you get into really weird gray areas where like if you know that like the head of a company just left and things are looking bad or like if you if you were to hear about the irrational layoffs before the employees knew, sure. like it puts you in this weird position, you know, and I, I still think like moving on that info, if you're positive, it's true. I don't think necessarily makes you evil or awful or doing anything bad, 
but man does it put those employees in a crappy position and man yeah. does it put their bosses who were you know it's 9 56 and at 10 they were about to announce it of you course. know like yeah, yeah. there's obviously always going to be areas like that that are complicated um and i i think news is like you know i, I talk about coming in with a to-do list and then the nine things I thought I would do that way, that day, I do 10 other things instead. I think in that same way, it is sort of, we never know what's going to kind of fall into our laps or, or what we're going to figure out. And then it's kind of evaluating, well, what do we do with that? And is it, you know, I do think that there's a point where like, if you're really going to burn a bridge with it, like you better make sure you're right. Cause yeah. I, I do think there have been plenty of embarrassing moments in, in plenty of outlets histories where like they did get something wrong. And, and I don't know, like, I, I think that puts you, it, it, in that way, I do think you have a responsibility to your audience to fact check and to verify and to make sure you're doing it right. So with the verification, like what does that even look like? So are there certain sources, like I imagine PlayStation blog and the Xbox wire or whatever it's called. Oh, which are obviously like official and, channels. And so if you get yeah. that, that's just cool. This is fact. We're running it. But what if it comes from any other source? What does the process look like? Yeah, an official channel, obviously, like. I guess like the PlayStation blog could get hacked or like a verified Twitter account can get hacked and you'll see stuff occasionally that like, oh, that's weird. It, or they made a typo or whatever it is. Occasionally that stuff does happen. Um, if someone emails us and they're like, hey, I work at Nintendo and I have Metro Prime 4 footage I want to show you. Like it then becomes like, okay, like prove it. You know, like, like number one, like my priority is like, I, I want to see it and I want to talk to that person. And I want to make sure they like, what do you have to show me? Like, let's look at it. But I want, proof of that them being who they say they are and sometimes that's not even something we'll publish necessarily but like we have to see like verify your employment and all of that separate from that we then have to like someone giving us an asset is is hard because that's a harder thing to to verify than i think information if someone tells you something trying to find another source to verify the information is a little more straightforward as opposed to like showing someone a video and saying is this real mm -hmm. uh it, it's a weird boat to be in though where you have to make sure like sometimes information will come out or, or someone will tell us something and then we want to verify it. But maybe both of those people we're talking to are getting their information secondhand and maybe they're even getting it from the same person and mm. that person misheard it in the first place. So then we think we confirmed something, but really you didn't. You just had one guy who misheard someone else on the phone or saw something over someone's shoulder and misread it and he tells you. But then separately, he tells Greg, and then you two are talking to each other, and then you two are separately talking to me. Like, it, it's this weird game of telephone where, like, I think at this point, especially with, like, fake news and everything being what it is, I really, I would err on the side of really, like, overly cautiously double-checking anything before I ran at this point if, it, mm. if it's not from something official. And I think it, it puts us in a tough spot because sometimes we hear about stuff early, and then it gets announced, and we're like, oh, man, we knew that. Like, we could have gotten that scoop. But I don't really regret it because I also don't want to be in the other side of the coin, which is we are confident enough to run this and then we're wrong. And yeah. then and then, you know, you're dealing with the backlash of that. So talking about the official channels, like sometimes I've noticed, even if it is an official channel, especially when you start looking at the worldwide uh, point of view of it all. Like, do you kind of take certain things as more credible than others? Like in terms of like an example I have is recently the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy they still are being really cagey on is it exclusive or is it not exclusive? And they haven't come out and actually said it. And then PlayStation, I don't know, Ireland or something yeah. tweeted um, like, oh, no, Crash Bandicoot is exclusive to PlayStation. And then NeoGAF exploded with it. Like, oh, they said it's exclusive. And it's like, I don't believe that as a user. <laughs> you yeah. Know? But what, what would you guys take from that? It's hard because, yeah, like I, I say official sources as though everyone knows what that means. Like, I think for me, there's definitely the kind of this hierarchy, right, where like the actual PlayStation blog or the words coming out of Sean Layden's mouth on stage during a press conference, you're good to go. Like something that is sent to us from Sony in a press release, you're good to report on that. Like those are generally going to be okay. A release date on Amazon or GameStop, maybe not as set in stone because a lot of those things are placeholders or a lot of those things are old info. And then even less so when you get into like international affiliates, like even us, even IGN, for example, like we have the sites that publish to IGN.com, which are our US office, our UK office, our LA office, and our San Francisco office. And then we have these uh, franchisees that, that are, are international. So like there's IGN Benelux and, and IGN France, and IGN Espana, and these companies that are, they're the IGN name and they're you know, part of our global push. If we have an exclusive, we can put our stuff on all those sites at once, but their editorial staff operates autonomously and, and doesn't like isn't dialed into us. I think that can be true of PlayStation and Nintendo and everyone else that like 
what comes from, you know, the PlayStation Ireland might not have come from the mothership or it might be a contracted social media agency that some customer service guy just thought it was exclusive and said it, you know, but didn't actually get that information directly from. He the thinks he's mouth. answering a simple question, and it turns out this isn't simple at all. It's exactly. similar to like Agent M on the Marvel stream recently this yeah. week, right? Where he's like, "Oh yeah, and Spider Man's coming to PlayStation Four this year," and and Insomniac's like, "No, no, yeah. there's no release date yet." And it's like you, from us having covered this, worked in this industry, you understand how that happens. That yep. yep Agent M, who's on every Marvel thing ever, yeah, he, I'm sure he's not up to date on every Marvel video game release, as well as the comics, as well as this, yep. as well as the movies. Yeah. So yeah, the Amazon release date thing. Mm-hmm. So that happens all the time. And most of the time it's like December 31st, whatever that year is. It's usually or, tied or to a like court. Like if they've said summer, it'll be whatever, June 1st or, but, or July 1st. But let's say that you, you today, you note like someone sends you a tip or whatever. And it's like, hey, look, uh, whatever game, I don't know, like Spider-Man uh, has a release date of September 21st. Like something that is a little bit more random. Poe's birthday. What would be your, Ooh. what would be the process there of what, how you would handle that? Um, I mean, part of it is just common sense, right? Like if it's a, Monday or if it's a holiday <coughs> or yes yeah, Sunday or whatever like it's it's going to be immediately we're going to be like okay like that doesn't sound right or if it's like tomorrow you know stuff like like there are little things that are immediate red flags if it's a Tuesday and it's within the range then maybe we hunt around a little more look at what they've said and like that's how the Mass Effect release date was out there for so long that uh the Dark Horse art book like yeah, yeah. months and months before EA officially announced it had that release date out there and we did report on that because that was a uh, partner of the publisher who clearly had gotten some kind of information and it seemed accurate so we reported on it and we're careful with our words it's according to this amazon mm-hmm. listing according to dark horse and we also reach out for comment you know we don't like one of the things that the laziest thing i think you could do is if uh, a ken levine or a jeremy dunham or whoever tweets something about their game uh, isn't it weird yeah Love it's that. always <laughs> weird to say dunham and be like um, oh about the game if they say something on twitter that seems whoa that's surprising or whoa that's out of character or whoa they're really negative about something reporting on that without reaching out i think would be irresponsible on our part because i think that we by virtue of being ign have those avenues where we can say hey people are freaking out over this tweet like what did you mean or did you mean this how you said it or like let us clarify blah blah blah, blah. um i think with retailers there's a little less room to do that um mm. It's it's I can reach out to Amazon and be like, hey, where did you get this September 21st release date for Spider-Man? Probably going to get an automated response or nothing. Um, I can reach out to PlayStation. I can reach out to Insomniac. Probably going to get no comment. So like, we don't comment on rumor and speculation. Exactly. So at that point, it's hard. I mean, at that point, it does become more of a uh, gut feeling. And we've run plenty of things like that. And then it gets updated and removed. Or Insomniac does six hours later say like, Hey, like that really said it's not right. September's not right. We haven't announced anything. And then, you know, we'll update our story and mm. put a correction or put that in. So it does get into that area where um, a lot of it is just instinct after having done it for a while. Where yeah. like some things, sometimes you see a date on Amazon or GameStop and you're like, that feels right. Yep. Or, or sometimes, I mean, it's hard if we already know. That's the even harder thing. It's like if we've been told off the record a date and then that date leaks, it gets complicated too because like we can't mm. use the information that we've been given to influence our reporting. So we still have to treat it as though, well, take it with a grain of salt. But yeah, this person saying exactly, hmm. or or just you know treat it as like let's still go down the rabbit hole of, let's go to the official site and and there have been completely bizarre cases where like the actual Nintendo or PlayStation site will put a release date quietly on the product page that hasn't been announced yet, and sometimes someone digs that up, or sometimes yeah. it's on. PSN, uh, like the Telltale Guardians of the Galaxy date was appearing on PSN before it had been announced. There's definitely weird little examples like that where, yeah, sometimes it's legit and sometimes maybe we passed on it and we shouldn't have. So that's interesting. This is something I've never had to deal with. If you get embargoed information, like say some like Sp- Insomniac like says to you, hey, IGN, Spider-Man's release date is September 21st. Um, and, you know, you can't talk about that until July. Yeah. Then you hear like someone else confirms it and it gets confirmed and all that. And you know, you confirm from other people. Are you still under embargo there? Yeah. So it's, it's a weird thing, right? It's uh, in a perfect world. We keep that information on kind of this need to know where it's like, if we know what the release date is, like, like I'm probably going to know it. And then whoever I signed to write it under embargo is going to know it. But ideally like Jose and Brandon and Miranda don't know so that when it leaks, they can write that story and, you know, source wherever it came from and write like, oh, Amazon says September 21st for Spider-Man. Even if, you know, Jonathan and I know that's true, 
like they're writing, sourcing Amazon, taking a screenshot. And, uh, you know, I don't think that's violating embargo because the information's out there and they're mm. saying according to Amazon. James Stevenson at Insomniac is like, stop using our game as a fake example. <laughs> stop saying September 21st. God Man, damn if, it. If that is watch watch the every new site report. According to the kind of funny games yeah, cast. Yeah. <laughs> Take it with a grain of salt, but they sure were hung up on September 21st for Spider-Man. Uh, then there's the weirder things like, um, you know, like the the Final Fantasy Uncovered event or whatever, like when something comes out ahead of time, like, you know, like we, we wrote like, Hey, according to this leak, this is the case. But then we wrote that night, Hey, this was officially confirmed now. Or like same thing with the destiny leak for destiny Two, Hey, according to these posters, destiny Two September, blah, blah, blah. And then we run a separate story. Bungie officially confirms destiny Two release date. So I think it just like, I think the, the most important thing to distill for us is that provenance of a story is that source is where is this actually coming from when we put something out there? Because like, it drives me insane, even on the the kind of funny and beyond Facebook groups, when I see people like, oh my God, like, I can't believe that Wolverine's going to be in Iron Man 4. And it's like, you know, like marvelmovienews.org or Tumblr, yeah. marvelmovienews.tumblr.com. And it's like, you can't trust that. But at the same time, like it's, you know, it would be naive of me to think that everybody understands that distinction. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure what those people do would mystify me. And I wouldn't, I, you know, wouldn't understand pieces of it. So last question I have, and this kind of has to do with the, a lot of people listening now, how many people, so obviously there's all the people that work at IGN and, and most the edit, edit, editorial staff mm-hmm. writes news articles in some fashion, right? Yeah. For the most like, part, we have a kind of a rotating news shift. So it's like, you know, every Wednesday, Jose's on news duty and every Friday, Miranda's on news duty yeah. and we'll have people kind of, um, you know, for a set chunk of the day, just keeping an eye out and whether that means writing stories on their own or just editing and publishing stories that freelancers have written. Like, did you have like to that. do news when you were oh, back in the, the day? Yeah, totally. Okay. totally. Yeah. When, yeah, when that, you were on the PlayStation team, you did a lot. Yeah. That was the thing is like news was, is I've seen news evolve and that's why I'm just letting it go for a talk because obviously we have no idea what it's like there anymore. But I remember when it was, uh, I came in right after David Adams left and I'm pretty sure he founded the news team with Damon and uh, Kathleen, right? And that's why Scoop was a thing or whatever. But that was in the day where it was like, oh, Bethesda put out this uh, uh, press release. All right, news team, put it up. And they just put up the press release. Yeah, you know they used I mean? to put up raw uh, ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Right. And it was just how that was at the time. And then it slowly evolves into this, that, and the other and talking huh. to people and getting sources. And yeah. yeah. So in addition to the, the editorial staff, there's also a team of contractors. How many people do you have working for you for news? And how do you kind of we have like, who is credible yeah it's weird because we have a uh, news is interesting because i would say it's the highest turnover for freelancers because it's um it's like we pay per story so we don't pay like a flat rate or, or salary or anything like that for our contract and freelancers so it's a volume game like for us it's like if you write a ton of news stories like you can do well but you know i remember freelancing like if i had the chance to be making you know a small amount per story versus writing guides for, you know, 500,000 bucks a pop for some other site. Like I totally get why people will occasionally leave an IGN news freelance gig to go as in knock the mic over to go do something else. Like that makes sense. And so I think, um, we have kind of a constantly turning staff of like 12 to 20 solid news freelancers across all the different time zones. So some work with our UK team. Um, we're slowly building back up the Australian freelance team. And then the, the majority of our freelancers are on East coast or Pacific time. So since it sounds like it's more of a, a one-off basis thing because it's per story, it seems like a, an easier way to get into uh, games media. So for the longest time, I think the foot in the door at IGN, the way I did it, the way like Hillary Goldstein did it, the way Colin did it, a lot of people was through guides. I think uh, guides and now wikis are still a pretty good way to start contributing. So Jared to, did it too, right? Yeah, for sure. It, it's a, it's a, in Marty. I mean, like there are a lot of people who started heard of them. By, doing, uh, by doing strategy guides and it was a good foot in the door. And with wikis, it still is because you can... If you kick ass making wiki edits, like they'll notice you and they'll bring you on for freelance and, and stuff like that. I think news has become a really good alternate path to that. Um, but news is very different. Like it's, at least the way we do news, like I, I like to keep opinion out of news. I, I see news as sort of the foundation of all of the other content we'll do. So like I remember back when the, um, I think it was Dead Island, I forget if it was Riptide or just Dead Island had like the, uh, the um, special edition. Uh, that was the like bus a that was just, yeah, 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 it was yeah, like yeah. a, like, just like no head and just like a bikini on boobs. And it was just like a body. And we had this like debate in the office of, well, do we run this as like literally like do the Kotaku style headline of like the deadline collector edition is fucking gross or run it with an opinionated headline. Or do you say Dead Island collector edition announced stick to the facts. And then, 
use that as a launching pad for an opinion piece that is, hey, the Dead Island Collector's Edition is fucking gross. And for us, it's the latter. For us, it's like we will get straight news out and then follow up with opinion, follow mm-hmm. up with a video talking about why we don't like it or, or something like that. Um, there are occasional, there's occasional gray areas where something happens where I think it's okay to put a little bit of speculation into the story. Like, for example, the release date example we were talking about. Maybe you oh, say you Spider-Man coming out on September 21st. On September 21st, worldwide. Um, also the Xbox. Take over the Grand uh, <laughs> And the Nintendo Switch. I think we'll say, hey, take this with a grain of salt because this is six days from now and Insomniac probably, you know, like we'll, we'll put context in in cases like that. But um, we play news pretty straight. Mm. Okay. My question would be uh, twofold, I think, is right now, do you think that there's a problem with journalism? That's a thing that gets sure. thrown around a lot. What is it to you and how do you guys avoid it? I mean, I think part of it is the volume of things being announced every day is like staggering and like keeping up with all of the games coming to mobile, all the games coming to PC um, and also giving our audience what they care about. Like, like to be honest, like there's this like kind of cynical, like, oh, they're just doing it for the clicks mentality. I think when, when people run news, especially news that seems, you know, sensationalized in some way. But like we pay attention to what our audience likes. Sure. And if our audience starts really caring about Candy Crush or about Pokemon Go or about things that people kind of roll their eyes at, like speak with your clicks. Like, I mean, honestly, like if, if we have a Pokemon Go article that blows up and then another Pokemon Go announcement happens, we're going to hit Pokemon Go. And, you know, on, in the same vein, if we're covering Prey over and over or Mafia over and over or whatever it is, like we will pay attention to how well it's doing and let that determine <coughs> if it's worth us running cosmetic DLC. And if it's sure. worth us mm-hmm. running, you know, we'll always cover the big beats, a game announcement or release date, things like that for, for kind of the things in our wheelhouse. But it's everything else. It's all the granular, you know, if destiny releases a new patch or a new set of patch notes, that is all the balancing to their guns. We have to make that determination of like, we could just put this in our destiny wiki, which is where kind of the hardcore destiny players are going and they'll care about it. Or if we feel like it's significant enough or game changing enough, we will run a new story. That's destiny. Destiny's new patch completely changes shotguns or destiny's new patch makes fast travel easier than ever, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, it, it again is case by case. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, I, we have definitely cut down on the volume of news stories, I think, compared to what we used to do. I think IGN back in the day was, and especially in the days with posting press releases, but I think even now, like, we've definitely cut way down on being as broad as we were because the industry has gotten so wide. And if you try, like, if we had 50 more people just dedicated to news, I, I honestly don't think we could keep up with all the mobile releases, all the Steam releases, on top of all of the granular updates to console games. It, sure. It's just too much. And so I think now we, we do have to pick and choose. We do it based on what we either think will do well, that our audience cares about, uh, that we personally find interesting or that we're passionate about. Because I do think part of the power of having a platform like IGN is that we can kind of be tastemakers. We can push something and say, we really believe in this game or we're really passionate about this game or we're experts in this game and here's why you should care. Mm-hmm. And our responsibility at that point is maybe this game doesn't do well with our audience, but how do we get them to care? How do yeah. we make them interested? So in addition to just the volume of articles, what about like the volume of words in an article? Because something that I found interesting, especially now that we do the kind of funny morning show, every day we just read articles like from from IGN constantly, yep. GameSpot, everybody constantly. Stop. Whoever... I, there must be like three or four freelancers who write as Joe Scrabbles. Just knock it off. Make, get, let, let them use their real names. I'm sick of this pen name. Yeah. <laughs> Dude turns out a lot. Yeah. He's really, uh, Joe's awesome. Oh, and, we know because we read his shit every day. Yeah, I mean, it's that weird. Well, I mean, sorry. I, you well, can but the, yeah. the point there is I feel like there's I, almost every single article, especially when I, I'm reading them, I start reading through it. And I'm just like kind of in robot mode where I'm like, and this happened, this happened, this happened. And I get to that part where I'm like, oh, no, no this, this stuff doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, that's right? like the below the fold. Like, I, I think we get to that point where. So I, I'm personally a proponent of small, short stories. Just get the facts out and maybe a little bit of context about why we care. Like something like Final Fantasy 15 or The Last Guardian getting a release date. I don't think it's inappropriate to be like, this is a long time coming. This game was originally announced. Here's the eight, context nine, for why this matters. Yeah. yeah. But I'm talking like, more about like there's always that final paragraph that you hit. And it's not it, it's literally every site does this where it's just like for more yeah, Persona and, five. And, and, for more, well, and I get that they're trying to link people to other things and that's cool. But I do feel like uh, recently there's been a trend to just give so much information and like kind of give the Twitter version of every other article written in the last three weeks about yeah. whatever it is. 
at the bottom of this news article. I personally, I when I edit stories myself, which like by virtue of meetings and event planning and stuff, I'm, I have less and less time to do. But when I edit stories myself, I, I cut a lot of that. I don't think that always needs to be there unless it's something like um, a really confusing ongoing story, like, or not even confusing, but like the the Facebook and uh, ZeniMax lawsuit over mm -hmm. Oculus or like uh, back when 38 Studios was going on yeah, or yeah. THQ when something is very, or, or Kojima with Konami, stuff like that where it's very clearly a part of an ongoing story. There's context. I think it is essential to do all those backlinks to like kind of, if hey, if you're just joining us, here's what's happened up till now. Because I think otherwise you don't understand why this story matters. Mm. Like Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy release date announced, no, you probably don't need 30 paragraphs of context afterwards because people get it. Hey, this is a product. It's coming out on this day on these systems. But I think when it's more complicated than that, when it's something like um, how something affects the industry or uh, a person leaving the company, like Peter Moore leaving EA, like spending time on his background and legacy and, and the fact that he, you know, what he did before yeah. that and all of that, like that stuff, I do think enriches the story and is fine. Mm -hmm. I just think it's um, hit or miss on, or, or it's kind of case by case. I do... My biggest, like, if, if you are applying to be a freelancer with us specifically, I think my biggest pet peeve is when someone nails the information about a show. So they're like, oh, the Flash is renewed for season three and, and blah, blah, blah. And they get all of the important stuff right. And then they have this context section where they screw up, where it's like in the bottom half of the story, they're like, the Flash is the first ever superhero show to appear in the CW. It's like, well, no, Arrow came first. Like, I feel like the context is where people get into trouble mm -hmm. is trying to go back and you know, look at Wikipedia or whatever it is to, to act like you're an expert. And so my feedback for news writers, at least for us, is if you know it, if you if you yeah. have been following the story, feel free to, to link back. But I don't see it as necessarily essential. Are our contractors or anyone incentivized by like word count? Uh, no, not for us. Uh, I, I do think that there's um, we will pay a better rate if you, you know, we're talking about original news and stuff. If someone brings us an opportunity or a scoop uh, or if they secure an interview themselves and then, you know, want to offer it to us to publish, like we'll give more for that than we would for just, Hey, can you write up this PS blog post or whatever it is? Um, so in that way it's incentivized, but we don't, we don't have a minimum or maximum for our writers and we don't have, um, we don't really do a lot of sites will run stories at specific times. So it's like, there's a three o'clock slot, a three thirty mm. slot, a four o'clock and they'll space out news that way. Uh, we tend to do it more as it's, you know, we'll, publish it as it's written basically yeah. um which i think can give the kind of discovery problem of hey our front page is 30 new stories at once if everything you know the game of thrones trailer happening at the same time as the destiny trailer last week is a perfect example of two major high priority things happening at once with those happening there's no way we're also going to write about you know the dlc drop for mafia 3 or whatever mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. like and that's the point where we kind of do have to prioritize what goes on the site right now and what can wait my final question is I think, you know, since we do the morning show and go through the news and all this different stuff, there's often this cr battle cry of there's too much journalism or uh, journalism. When are people going to do real video game journalism in the way you'd expect the Washington Post to cover sure. whatever and blah, blah, blah. And what I've noticed more and more with our industry as we there are the, all right, PlayStation Blogs put up this release date. Sites are regurgitating that or, re or posting that. Regurgitating makes sense. They're putting that information out there, right? Because I, as, as a consumer, I don't want to go to the, every, the UB blog and the PlayStation blog and this blog and that blog to cobble this all together. Yep. Then it's mixed in with what you're talking about, the scoops you're getting, that Jason Schreier is getting, that Patrick's getting. What I notice a lot is the fact that Deadline and Variety and all these other entertainment-based news outlets look a lot like our video game news outlets in the same way that I think. Do you think that the future of video game journalism is more in that 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 camp, or is it going to continue to mature? And we're going to see your waypoints and your polygons break off, and they are able to succeed doing. I'm only doing this. I'm not talking about that. So it's too. First of all, I guess I never really answered your journalism thing in the first place. So I guess I should say. The biggest thing, and, and we are totally aware of that, right? The aggregation of the Reddits, the gaffes, all of that, and, and trying to become more than just, hey, we're publishing the marketing materials for this. You know, like at a certain point, like if eight releases get announced on one day, the top eight stories in our site might all just be things that came directly from the publisher that you could find essentially anywhere. And so like to battle against that, one thing we're working on now is asking that question of, so what? And, exactly. and we're trying to do these more follow-up features of, okay, so... Well, uh, Logan was number one at the box office this weekend, but like, what does that mean? And you know, like, how does that compare to other X Men movies? And and what are the legs on it? And, and does opening weekend matter with inflation and all of that? Um, and then, so with video game press releases, 
maybe we do get the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy thing, but it doesn't say we're ex- if it's exclusive. Sure. And that's the question we're asking is, is gotcha. kind of enriching that story that way. So that's how we're fighting against that. Um, as far as like the future of games journalism, I think it's um, we're at this weird precipice now where we everything I just said about enriching that story, we have to do because I think ultimately <laughs> like Activision has a blog, Ubisoft has a blog, Sony has a blog, Microsoft sure. has a blog, sure. Nintendo has directs like more and more you know you don't need a middleman to deliver to your audience and like maybe our audience right now might be bigger than the number of people who read the playstation blog but the hardcore playstation crowd is still probably going to go directly to the source in a lot of cases Mm -hmm. and so i think like in order to keep game journalism going i think it is the things that aren't necessarily subscribing to that pr drop mentality which is you know the leaks and the scoops and things like that but then it's also if you are going to report on the the thing that people have put out there what can you add to Added it? value. Like what yeah. can you, what interview can you get to a company that, that is giving the people more information? So like when they announced the Castlevania Netflix series, Jonathan immediately talked to the showrunner and, and got a little bit more on it, you sure. know, and, and got a little bit more context. And I think those are the cases where I like our news product and I, I feel like it's, it's worth coming to. Um, I think the, the journalism thing is a real concern and it's something that like, I think kind of left unchecked, it would be very easy for that to be the only thing we run. And I I think that would be bad. And I do think at that point it would be like, well, as a reader of the site, as a fan of the site, why am I coming here and not just going to Sony or Ubisoft? Well, I mean, I've always felt even when I was there that you got, it's such a, it's such a bad deal. It's such a bad look that you can't help because I know firsthand from covering PlayStation for so long that there are gatekeepers. It can't be that, I heard this about Naughty Dog, and I go straight to Naughty Dog. You have to go to PlayStation to get to them yep. to do that, and PlayStation will give you, we don't comment on rumors and speculation. Yep. So you get to that point of like, well, why even go to this? This this relationship doesn't work, so it's impossible to do real journalism if you're just getting cut off at the knees, and that's where it is. I'm going to speak on background. I'm going to speak off the record. I'm going to speak with a fake name. I'm going to give you, that's why the leaks are so prevalent. Because what is your fake name? My fake name, Joe Scrabbles. It's the only way to get any information out of these people that isn't PR approved, which gets so weird and weird. And that's why, as you see more and more indie start to do stuff, that's interesting because those guys get to go out and speak with their mind on whatever they want to do. Yeah, like a Steve Gaynor or uh, Sean Vanneman can just get up and talk about their game more openly. I think uh, as people get, you know, like, and and those are interesting examples, actually, because you have these kind of high-profile indie developers who are working with the big first parties. And Mm -hmm. so maybe they do have to, you know, keep an eye on Mind what they can say. Yeah, yeah. Whereas like when you get a, a fully true independent, like I can say whatever I want, smaller game, I think you do tend to get more candid answers. Yeah. Um, even like, uh, like we mentioned Dunham, like the what interview Dunham? he did here and the interview he did with Jonathan Nigian, like he's able to kind of speak more openly about their future plans yeah. because he doesn't have 30 people above him watching every word he says, you know? So yeah, so he did that interview with Colin a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago on um, Kind of Funny. Who has to listen to that? And like who writes those art? Like how how does that work? Like do you just tell one of the contractors, hey, listen to this and write interesting if we things? Think, if we think news might come from it, yeah. In the same way that like I also do that with our own content. Like if if McCaffrey does an episode of IGN Unfiltered, like we have someone who, oh, awesome, he's talking to Peter Molyneux and listens to that episode. And either McCaffrey will say, hey, I think this will make a good headline, or that person, whether it's someone internal or a freelancer or whoever, will be like, oh, like it's crazy that he said this. I think that should be a headline, and he'll run it by me and McCaffrey and stuff like that. Um, so like I just consume a lot of content in general. Like I, I the interviews that Colin did all during uh, GDC GC. were incredible. And actually, everything we're talking about, like please listen to the interview that uh, Colin did with Jason from Kotaku because Schreier like has much more to say. And is is I think uh, more articulate than I am, but also just like I think is more in the trenches than I am at this point. Um, and he had so much great insight. I, I super recommend that for anyone who's been interested in this rambling. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it. It's a complicated beast. I feel like reviews are complicated in their own way for a thousand reasons, but it's ultimately you get the game, you know what you can publish by a certain date, you have an embargo, do you have time to play it? Can it get up by this date? Like, I think it's a little more of an exact (laughs) science than Mm -hmm. news. I feel like news is a lot of checking your gut and uh, really digging deep to make sure that like what you're running is, is, you know, it's that balance between being accurate and being timely. And like, yeah, I can spend six months verifying something before I run it, but by the time I run it, it's probably old news, or I'm, oh, it turns out Spider-Man is coming out on September 21st, and it's December, Call never knew date. that, you know? Uh, so I think, like, that doesn't, you know, I, I don't want to wait so long that it's not topical anymore, but I also don't want to just rush into it and have that situation where we did go on one source, or we did kind of pull the trigger too early. Um, 
And so I don't know it can be hard. It can also be hard when, you know, one of our peers in the industry, like a, a competitor in the same way that we have in the past, does break an embargo by mistake. And then it is that awkward position where, well, crap, like all of us, you know, we're waiting until this time on this day to report this news. But whoever it is went early and then maybe we just source, hey, you know, kind of funny. It just revealed that blah, blah, blah happened. Hey, and yeah. <laughs> we didn't way, do it. Way to break it. <laughs> Damn yeah. it, Kevin. So, I know it's complicated. Uh, it's something that I, I, news is like such a weird, I, I think I forgot in leaving for, a, for a, a, a little over a year, how kind of on call you feel at all times. Like mm -hmm. even, especially with stuff like celebrity deaths and like things that there's just no way for us to prepare for. It is crazy verifying things that you would just, totally take for granted as like you see it on Twitter and you're like, like watching you guys react to the invincible news the other day is basically me a hundred times a day. <laughs> that's where so it's like, funny. It's exactly like, oh, I don't that. believe it. This can't yeah. be. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's exactly what it is. It's like someone on Twitter or some, you know, someone on the other side of the office, like John Borba stands up and is like, Hey, did you guys hear this? And I'm like, Oh, what? And then like we go through and like, maybe it ends up being BS. I'm like, Oh no, that's coming from this. You idiot Borbus. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, it's such a weird, we live in this weird gray area where like I, I have to just, essentially, I have to just go with what I, you know, think in my gut is right. And we totally do get it wrong. We've run plenty of corrections. And then there are other times where I'm like very proud of the fact that we were first on something or very proud of the fact that like we handled it well. So it's hard. That's awesome, man. I got a couple questions from the audience for you. About news? No, just about other stuff. We'll find out there. This is from JDOS 2K. How was oh, your time yeah. working for a game dev like Gearbox versus the press media like IGN? Uh, it was really educational. I mean, they, I make fun of Texas a lot, but like, I, I still love the people at Gearbox. Like those people were great to me. And it was a very, like, I had like a very like familial feeling there because so many of them were older than me or, you know, married and had houses. And I was just like this dude in a little apartment. Um, I think I learned more about the process than I thought I would. Um, just kind of watching how many moving parts there are that go into something. And then by being on the side I was, where I was hosting our panels and I was um, doing a lot of like behind the scenes blog posts and things like that. And like at the time we were uh, trying to ramp up a podcast and things like that, I was getting this sort of the same experience I had doing interviews for press, except without that, oh, hey, we can't comment on members. Like without that barrier. So yeah, it was yeah. like conversations could go one step further than they ever had. And that was fascinating to me. Like just getting one-on-one -on -one time with people who were just like, so smart, like like uh, Matt Charles and Paul Hulquist and Anthony Birch and all these people who I felt like I learned so much about their discipline from having conversations with them every day. Um, could not say enough nice things about like Randy Varnell, Aaron Lindy. Like there are just so many smart people there um, that taught me things I, I never would have imagined about. You know, again, like I, I use this as an example over and over, but like the amount of time that goes into like an animation loop or like into like making sure that like, hey, like this specific art asset is perfect mm. or even like even down to things like working with publishers and and the strategy behind release timing and the strategy behind like when you're announcing something and how much you show and when that does leak and when that does get screwed up how do you react and what do you do like i got sort of this weird because i was technically in the marketing department um and so i was kind of doing this like uh role as like a almost like a historian i guess like weirdly like in that i was from day one trying to be in there watching the pre-production of something to do behind the scenes stuff and that never ended up really materializing but i learned a lot from sitting with the various disciplines doing that and then kind of when i was with the marketing team i learned a lot of hey like this is how many drafts something has to go through before like and, and not even like a press release but like stuff like the back of the box and the text and menus and, and the things that are just totally not anything you would ever spend time thinking about. Um, all of that, like every piece of a game now, when I look at it, I feel like I'm thinking of it differently in the same way that before I ever did this, I was an extra. And when I was on a movie set, I totally watch movies differently now because I notice stuff in the background or I, I think about like changes in location in a way I never did when I was just watching movies, having never set foot on a set. So I, I think it just gave me kind of this weird, like just barely peek behind the curtain. Yeah. Um, and I should clarify that like I wasn't in like a proper dev role at all. So it's like I still I understand so little about like engine work or even about like checking in builds and stuff like I got like just kind of the like tip of the iceberg on that stuff uh, just in the rare occasions where I would have to like look at something like in development. But man, like I, I'm still so ignorant on that stuff. Yeah. And on all the tech stuff, obviously. 
I'm How do you feel dumb. about uh, Anthony Birch talking mad shit on Persona 5 on Twitter? Ooh, yeah, I mean, he he's not the only one I've seen saying they weren't crazy about the localization. I think it's... um. There definitely are. Don't get me wrong. I do think there are a couple weird choices in this localization. I do think that, you know, playing through Persona 4, I feel like I had less of that reaction. Mm-hmm. But I also feel like I'm holding this one to a higher standard in some ways. Plus, having played it in Japanese, I had a little bit more of a weird preconceived notion on certain things. Sure. But yeah, no, I mean, Anthony is like, I'm, I didn't make it. I didn't make Persona. Like, it's, I think he's allowed to complain. You're dead to him, Anthony. That's what he says. <laughs> I like Anthony a lot. Zach Walter wants to know, what does Andrew think of dreams and the future of Media Molecule? <laughs> He's been a fan of their games before. I'm interested in on his thoughts on the future of the studio. I'm so happy to exist. I'm so happy Sony doesn't like when every time I see <laughs> We'll see how long they exist. Well, it's just every time I see like, you know, a you know, a, a big big or a zipper or any of these like smaller studios go away, I'm like, oh, Nami Molecule, you know, and it's you know, I think when every time Sony kind of consolidates their pool of worldwide studios, I understand why. It, it's it, I've never had a moment where I'm like they shut down Naughty Dog? What? You know, like, <laughs> it's never like, I feel like the writing is always going to be on the wall with like a, you know, a certain brand and, yep, and yep, not yep, yep. So like that is never surprising. Little Big Planet I worry about, or I mean, I'm a little bit playing Jesus. Media Molecule I worry about because I think um, Tearaway is awesome on Vita. I don't think it sold really well, uh, obviously. I don't think that PS4 did any favors. Tearaway unfolded, yeah. Yeah, and so now Dreams to me looks so cool. And I talked to those guys at E3 2015 about it. And then they said more at Paris games week. And we've seen so many cool streams and like, I get what they're going for, but I still don't understand that as a $60 project or product. I still don't understand it as something that wasn't just like with PSVR. Like there are just so many, there's so many spots where I was like, Oh, like announce it's available now at PSX or make it a pack in with PSVR. Or there are so many beats where I was like, this seems like a smart time to push dreams. Like this feels like a good empty pocket where now I wonder what their strategy is. Mm-hmm. Um, but all of that being said, like that's so much more on like the business side, on the creative side, like thank God for Media Molecule, man. Like keep Sony weird. In the same way, it's like keep Nintendo weird. Like I want Nintendo to be doing creative things. Like for every, you know, motion control thing I'll roll my eyes at or, or weird experiment that they do, I'm also so happy it's happening because it's pushing things forward. Yeah. And I think it would be really boring if we just had, you know, three PS4s in our apartment with different logos in the front of them. Um, I think the same is true for Sony's staple of, of studios and, and their library of games like Horizon, Uncharted, Infamous, like so many things that are just these awesome brands and awesome experiences I've had are great, but I still want those completely off the wall ones. Yeah. I, I still want something like Dreams where I can be like, holy crap, like you have to see this and like mm-hmm. want to show it off to people and want to explain or like marvel it in the same way I would at like a Minecraft creation be like, holy crap, someone built... And like I did with Little Big Planet, honestly, holy crap! Like someone built Final Fantasy VII in Little Big Planet, or holy crap, someone recreated all of Hogwarts in Minecraft. Like I feel like Dreams has the potential to be that. And the way they were describing it to me way back sounded so cool. Like this idea of like you are operating in this um, in this like creative space where everything can be uh, iterated upon. So it's like you might be designing something and you want a tree and you'll search the catalog for tree. And maybe you made a tree six months ago and I take it and I'm like, Oh, his tree's really cool, but a branch pointing upward would make it look even cooler. And I add a branch to it. And then your tree, if someone else checks it out, they can either check out the version that I made or roll it back to the one that you made and the tree that you've placed in your world. You can then accept my changes and edit, or you can keep it how it was like all of that. Like, that's one object. Now think of that on scale of 10 or a hundred or a thousand. Like when you think about this kind of shared creative world and the, and the kind of art people could make, that sounds dope. And especially in VR, like looking at that, that sounds so cool. But again, like, is that a $60 game? Is there a campaign? What is the campaign? Is it that they made like little big planet? They have these like bespoke levels. And so it's like a racetrack level. So you have a racing game, but it's like, I, I just don't know what that looks like yet. And I feel like I have such a, tenuous grasp on what dreams is and that makes me concerned considering it's been shown off for four years now yeah. more than four years now uh because we first saw it before it was titled at that original ps4 it reveal was moving everything yeah, yeah. so i i mean the, the, that was a really long answer to i think it's cool i hope it's cool i want to play it and like i love little big planet um i love mario maker i love little big planet i love I'm really bad at creating things, but I love playing things that other people have created. Um, yeah. And I especially love just going through random levels in both of those games. So, man, I, I want Dreams to be that. And, and I've said for years that, like, the thing I wanted from a little big planet was 
let me and and for Mario Maker is let me do it in a 3D plane. Let me make a Mario 64 and like maybe Dreams is that. Like you know, like maybe that is the the kind of next level of creation things because Project Spark kind of tried something like that and that didn't really work. So yeah. I don't know. I I really I I I want to be enthusiastic about it and I want to be optimistic about it, but the longer we go without seeing anything beyond those gameplay streams makes me worry a little yeah. bit. And and I do worry about the commercial prospects of it because it would be devastating to see Mini Molecule go away. Yeah. Final question. Do you think that we will ever get Mother 3? Yes. Me I do too. think eventually we'll get it in some virtual console capacity. I I think I, we're getting it this year. Ooh. I, well, I think it's going to be at least announced this year. I want to believe, man. I have been hurt before. Uh, I. It's so funny <laughs> because you look at the Earthbound community and they're these incredible, dedicated people that have kept something going for what, 22 years with almost no support. And especially like before Smash, really no support. And then now like Earthbound is on 3DS, it's on Wii U, it's, you know, Ness is better known because of Smash. I can go to Walmart and buy a Lucas toy, which just <laughs> blows my mind. Like that is so crazy. Um, I, I don't think it's impossible, but I also like, I think at this point it would be Nintendo just doing it to say here you go to yeah. the, to that niche i i don't see it as a commercial prospect it's also i've talked a lot about like what do you call it because yeah. it's not earthbound 2 i feel like that's misleading I, they don't want to lose like there are people who know lucas from smash so you gotta get lucas's name in there so is it like earthbound colon lucas's story yeah, i think that's something? what it would be yeah I like that i feel makes like sense. It, i feel like it would be something along those lines um but man i i hope we do i hope you're right i I'm kind of a natural pessimist at this point because I, it's, it's just, Nintendo. There You've have been, been burned so, so many times. Many rumors, yeah. yeah, there were so many times where it looked like it was going to happen and didn't. Yeah. All right. Well, Goldfire, this has been fantastic. I hope so. Man, you got to come back more. Yeah. Sure. You have fun to. stories. You're fun dude to talk to. Oh, thanks, man. I think you're a fun dude. Where, to talk where can to. people follow you? Uh, I'm Garfep on Twitter, which is uh, Greg always Who's regrets fucking, fucking elderly, elderly people. people. <laughs> As it goes. Wait, really? It's no. a hard Twitter handle, so that's what, what we had to come up with. You know, an anagram? No, uh, acronym for what yeah. it stood for. So that's really what it came what up with. What is it? What? Oh, it's such a long story. I okay, mean, I, yeah. we'll have to have you back um, another yeah, time. But I'm there. I'm on Garf, yeah, I, I, Garf EP was always what I, I that's defaulted closer. to reading funny, it. That's Funny you should say that, yeah. Oh, the EP is, is accurate. All right, well, you can follow him there and also on IGN where he does all yep. of his other stuff. Uh, yeah, until next time. I love you. Oh, is that your sign off? That is my sign off. What a cute sign off. Yeah. He's a cute boy. I'm a cute boy. What's up, party people? If you like that content, subscribe by clicking here to Kind of Funny Games. Or if you want content that's not games related, subscribe by clicking there. If you want to support us on Patreon, boom, right there. Other stuff too. I'm limited to 20 seconds for this. Till next week. I'll see you later.